The meeting of the committee will come to order. Over the past 25 years, a sophisticated campaign has been waged to privatize government services. The theory is that corporations can deliver government services better and at a lower cost than the government. Over the last six years, this theory has been put into practice. The result is that privatization has exploded for every taxpayer dollar spent on federal programs, over 40 cents now goes to private contractors. Our, go our government now outsources even the oversight of the outsourcing. At home, core government functions like tax collection and emergency response have been contracted out. Abroad, companies like Halliburton and Blackwater have made billions performing tasks that used to be done by our nation's military forces. What's been missing is a serious evaluation of whether the promises of private privatizing are actually realized. Inside our government, it has become an article of faith that outsourcing is best. Today, we're going to examine the impact of privatization on our military forces. We will focus on a specific example, the outsourcing of military functions to Blackwater a private military contractor providing protective services to U.S. officials in Iraq. We will seek to answer basic questions. Is Blackwater a private, is Blackwater a private military contractor helping or hurting our efforts in Iraq? Is the government doing enough to hold Blackwater accountable for alleged misconduct? And what are the costs to the federal taxpayers? I want to thank Eric Prince, Blackwater's founder and CEO, for his cooperation in this hearing. As a general rule, children from wealthy and politically connected families no longer serve in the military. Mr. Prince is an exception. He enlisted in the Navy in 1992 and joined the Navy SEALs in 1993, where he served for four years. And we thank you for that service. In 1997, he saw an opportunity to start his own company and created Blackwater. And he has said, quote, we're trying to do for the national security apparatus what FedEx did for the Postal Service, end quote. There may be no federal contractor in America that has grown more rapidly than Blackwater over the last seven years. In 2000, Blackwater had just $204,000 in government contracts. Since then, it has received over a billion dollars in federal contracts. More than half of these contracts were awarded without full and open competition. Privatizing is working exceptionally well for Blackwater. The question for this hearing is whether outsourcing to Blackwater is a good deal for the American taxpayer whether it's a good deal for the military, and whether it's serving our national interest in Iraq. The first part of that question is cost. We know that sergeants in the military generally cost the government between $50,000 to $70,000 per year. We also know that a comparable position at Blackwater costs the federal government over $400,000, six times as much. Defense Secretary Gates testified about this problem last week. He said Blackwater charges the government so much that it can lure highly trained soldiers out of our forces to work for them. He is now taking the unprecedented step of considering whether to ask our troops to sign a non-compete agreement to prevent the U.S. military from becoming a taxpayer-funded training program for private contractors. There are also serious questions about Blackwater's performance. The September 16th shooting that killed at least 11 Iraqis is just the latest in a series of troubling Blackwater incidents. Earlier this year, our committee examined the company's mistakes in Fallujah, where four contractors were killed and their bodies burned. That incident triggered a major battle in the Iraq war. New documents indicate that there have been a total 
of 195 shooting incidents involving Blackwater forces since 2005. Blackwater's contract says the company is hired to provide defensive services. But in most of these incidents, it was Blackwater forces who fired first. We have also learned that 122 Blackwater employees, one-seventh of the company's current workforce in Iraq, have been terminated for improper conduct. We have the best troops in the world. The men and women in our armed forces are extraordinarily able and dedicated. Their pay does not reflect their value, but they don't complain. So I have a high bar when I ask whether Blackwater and other private military contractors can meet the performance standards of our soldiers. In recent days, military leaders have said that Black Blackwater's missteps in Iraq are going to hurt us badly. One senior U.S. military official said Blackwater's actions are creating resentment among Iraqis that, quote, may be worse than Abu Ghraib, end quote. If these observations are true, they mean that our reliance on a private military contractor is backfiring. The committee's investigation raises as many questions about the State Department's oversight of Blackwater as it does about Blackwater itself. On December 24, 2006, a drunken Blackwater contractor shot the guard of the Iraqi vice president. This didn't happen out on a mission protecting diplomats. It occurred inside the protected green zone. If this had happened in the United States, the contractor would have been arrested and a criminal investigation launched. If a drunken U.S. soldier had killed an Iraqi guard, the soldier would have faced a court martial. But all that has happened to the Blackwater contractor is that he has lost his job. The State Department advised Blackwater how much to pay the family to make the problem go away and then allowed the contractor to leave Iraq just 36 hours after the shooting. Incredibly, internal emails document a debate over the size of the payment. The Charge d'Affaires recommended $250,000 payment, but this was cut to $15,000 because the Diplomatic Security Service said Iraqis would try to get themselves killed for such a large payout. Well, it's hard to read these emails and not come to the conclusion that the State Department is acting as Blackwater's enabler. If Blackwater and other companies are really providing better service at a lower cost, the experiment of privatizing is working. But if the costs are higher and performance is worse, and I don't understand why we're doing this. It makes no sense to pay more for less. We will examine this issue today, and facts, not ideology, need to guide us here. Yesterday, the FBI announced that it launched a criminal investigation into Blackwater's actions on September 16. This morning, the Justice Department sent a letter to the committee asking that in light of this development, the committee not take testimony at this time about the events of September 16th. Our precedent on this committee is that Congress has an independent right to this information. But in this case, Ranking Member Davis and I have conferred, and we have agreed to postpone any public discussion of this issue as we work with the Department to obtain the, inf the information that the committee lacks. For the same reason, at the request of the Justice Department, I'll ask our witness Mr. Prince and our State Department witnesses on the second panel not to discuss the September 16th incident in this public setting today. The last point I want to make is directed to the families of the Blackwater employees killed in Fallujah and the families of the soldiers killed in a tragic and unnecessary accident with Blackwater Airlines, some of whom are here today. I know many of you believe that Blackwater has been unaccountable to anyone in our government. I want you to know that Blackwater will be accountable today. We'll be asking some tough questions about disturbing actions, and I also want to assure Mr. Prince that we will be fair. And we will not tolerate any demonstrations or disturbances from anyone attending this hearing. 
thank you, and I'm looking forward to Mr. Prince's testimony. I want to recognize the ranking member, uh, Mr. Davis. Um, thank you, Mr. Waxman. You know, security contractors have been working at U.S. diplomatic posts for more than 20 years, but their extensive use in the midst of ongoing military conflict raises important new questions about the ability of government acquisition officials to manage and oversee those contracts, the vetting and training of security personnel, and how best to control and coordinate private security firms in a complex, highly dangerous battle space. Contracts for the use of force in war also pose legitimate questions about the propriety of hiring private firms to perform such a public, some would say inherently governmental function. But those complex questions won't be addressed responsibly by fixating on the operations of any one company, nor are we likely to learn much by focusing on one sensational incident still under investigation. So we appreciate Chairman Waxman agreeing to add testimony from State Department witnesses today. They will discuss overall management of the competitively awarded Worldwide Personnel Protective Services contract under which Blackwater and two other firms provide security services in Iraq. And we take the Chairman at his word there will be additional hearings to examine the broader range of important oversight issues implicated in the use of security contractors in hostile environments. Contractor personnel working in support of diplomatic and military activities abroad have become an inescapable fact of modern life. Today, they provide everything from logistics and engineering services to food preparation, laundry, housing, construction, and, of course, security. They offer invaluable surge capacity and contingent capabilities Federal agencies can't afford to keep in-house. By some estimates, the number of private contractors now exceeds total U.S. military personnel in Iraq. But the presence of so many foreigners, particularly so many with guns, offends some Iraqis and gives others a pretext to incite mistrust and violence. To paraphrase the title of one recent study of the phenomena, Iraqis fear they can't live with private security contractors. U.S. personnel believe they can't live without them. So it's critical the Departments of State and Defense get it right when they contract for sensitive security services in someone else's sovereign territory. However you define success in Iraq, from stay the course to immediate withdrawal and every scenario in between, security contractors are going to play an integral part. The inevitable redeployment of U.S. military units out of the current urban battle space will only increase the need for well-trained and well-managed private security forces to fill that vacuum and protect diplomatic and reconstruction efforts. As the lead editorial in this morning's Washington Post concluded, it is foolish to propose the elimination of private security firms in Iraq and Afghanistan, at least in the short term. Contract documents and incident reports reviewed by the committee suggest the State Department is trying to get it right. There is clear evidence of proactive management and oversight of security contractors in Iraq. The State Department requires specific qualifications and rigorous ongoing training for all contract security personnel, including extensive prior security experience and firearms proficiency. Those hired must also undergo background investigations and qualify for a security clearance. And the contract contains carefully crafted comprehensive provisions on standards of conduct for security personnel strict rules for the use of any type of force, and extensive reporting requirements when any incident occurs. But State Department oversight of security contractors seems to have some blind spots as well. There is little aggregate or comparative data on contractor performance, so it is impossible to know if one company's rate of weapons-related incidents is the product of a dangerous cowboy culture or the predictable result of conducting higher-risk missions. And incidents of erratic and dangerous behavior by security personnel from all the companies involved, not just Blackwater, are handled with little or no regard to Iraqi law. Usually the bad actor is simply whisked out of the country, whether the offense is a civilian casualty, negligent discharge of, of a weapon, alcohol or drug abuse, or destruction of property. To date, there has not been a single successful prosecution of a security provider in Iraq for criminal misconduct. Iraqis understandably resent our preaching about the rule of law when so visible an element of the U.S. presence there appears to be above the law. That is why the events of September 16 sparked such an outcry by the Iraqi government, which sees unpunished assaults on civilians as a threat to national sovereignty. The incident is also being used by those seeking to exploit accumulated resentments and draw attacks on private contractors, a force even the Iraqi government concedes is still a vital, vital layer of security. Given that volatile environment, we should take care not to prejudge the ongoing investigations into events of that, that day. Published eyewitness statements provide very contradictory accounts. But this much we know. Standard operating procedures for personnel security details dictate getting protected persons in U.S. vehicles away from an incident as quickly as possible. 
No one stays to secure the scene or to help frighten civilians. That is not their job. So we may never know who or how many shot first. In the time it takes to hide an AK-47, murderous insurgents and corrupt Iraqi police can be transformed into martyred civilians. We need to look at the proper role of security contractors in a war zone, not through the clouded lens of one company or one uncertain incident, but with a clear-eyed, objective view of what best serves the interests of U.S. personnel in theater and U.S. taxpayers at home. I look forward to that discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. While the rules do not provide opening statements for all members at a hearing, Mr. Davis and I have consulted about this, and I would like to ask unanimous consent that we have four members on each side designated by the chairman and the ranking member to be permitted to give a two-minute statement. Uh, when we begin the questioning, we will begin with 10 minutes controlled by the chairman and 10 minutes controlled by the ranking member. And I would further like to ask unanimous consent that Jan Schakowsky uh, be permitted, who is not a member of this committee, be permitted to join us at this hearing today. Is there any objection to this unanimous consent request? If not, uh, that will be the order. I would like to now uh, call on for uh, two minutes. Uh, it would be uh, Mr. Tierney for his uh, statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the fundamental question here ought to be whether or not it makes sense to contract out in the first place. Uh, we really need to reevaluate our use of private military contractors and determine what roles are appropriate or not for private firms and what must be kept in control of those in uniform or those in public service. You know, the all-voluntary all professional force after the Vietnam War employed the so-called Abrams Doctrine. The idea was that we wouldn't go to war without the sufficient backing of the nation. Outsourcing has circumvented this doctrine. It allows the administration to almost double the force size without any political price being paid. We have too few regular troops, and if we admitted that and tried to put in more, the administration would have to admit it was wrong in the way it prosecuted this war originally. We would have to recognize the impact on drawing forces out of Afghanistan. If we call up even more National Guard or reservists, uh, then it would cause even more of a protest among the people in this country that are already not sold on the Iraq venture. And if we relied more on our allies, they would have had to share the power, share the decision making, and share the contract work. So private contractors have allowed essentially this administration to add additional forces without paying any political capital. Very little conversation goes into the number of uh, people dedicated to their jobs on the private sector that are being killed or injured on a regular basis. Figures by one account are some nine individuals a week losing their lives uh, in the service of private contracting that are not counted in the figures of casualties reported to the American people. Outsourcing, as you uh, indicated, Mr. Chairman, seemed to increase the cost, not decrease the cost, and I hope we get into the numbers on that as the hearing goes on. It seems to be harming the very counterinsurgency effort uh, that General Petraeus seems to want to implement, and we have far too few government managers to oversee the situation. We need more accountability. We need to clarify and update our laws. We need to restore the government's ability to manage any such contracts. We need to punish corporations that commit fraud or undermine our security. But basically, we need to reconsider which jobs should be private and which jobs should remain in the public sector. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tierney. Chair, I would like to now recognize Mr. McHenry for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I, while we are the investigative committee of Congress, I believe it is irresponsible when an ongoing investigation uh, in the executive branch is uh, trying to establish the facts of the September 16th event that we call before uh, this committee uh, contractors involved with that. Establishing those facts are in included in those two ongoing investigations. And I believe it is irresponsible for us to convict before the executive branch has first established the facts of what did occur with the Blackwater incident in Baghdad. Um, Blackwater has protected dozens, if not hundreds, of members of Congress, including myself and members of this committee, when they traveled to Afghanistan and Iraq. I, for one, am grateful for their service. Not one single member of Congress has been injured nor killed under Blackwater protection, and for that I am grateful. Uh, let me be clear, we should not speculate on the actions of the men on September 16th. Those facts are not yet established. We need to get the facts on the record uh, on these contradictory uh, reports that are coming from media sources. Much is not clear. We have conflicting media reports written by reporters who were not present for the events. We do not yet have an authoritative report from the executive branch based on eyewitness accounts. 
Today, we should be reviewing the rules of contracting, investigating whether companies are following those rules, the legal ramifications, and whether the system of contracting should be modified and improved. These are the issues that we should be dealing with today. For the loss of any human life, justice must be served with thousands of soldiers, diplomats, and contractors risking their lives in such a dangerous region of the world, we should exercise patience in this process and Let's deal in solid facts, not simply follow the front trial lawyers, which this committee it appears has done over the last nine months. General Again, time has expired. contracting is the liberal cause du jour, and we should move past that and ensure that we have proper government service. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Maloney, recognized for two minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman uh, Waxman and Ranking Member Davis, for holding today's hearing to examine the heavy reliance upon private security contractors in Iraq and Afghanistan. There have been troubling reports about incidents involving Blackwater, where Iraqi civ civilians have been killed, and there have been many, many troubling reports. Today, we are basically going to examine the privatization of the military. What are the costs and what are the consequences of privatizing our military? Blackwater guards are highly trained and in some cases have been brave, yet they make six times more than our own military. And coming from a military family where my father lived, worked in, served in, in, in World War II and my brother in Vietnam, I do not believe that the Blackwater guards are any more brave or more committed or more disciplined or more effective than the American Armed Services. So our basic question, mine is today, is why are we using this service, contracting out, privatizing our military to a organization that has been aggressive and I would say in some cases reckless in the handling of their duties. And uh, there are many questions we have on accountability and, and basically, why are we doing this? We, we were told that we were going to contract out these security services to save the government money. But in fact, it is costing significantly more to pay Blackwater than it would for our own military to perform these duties. And their actions has really undermined our effectiveness in Iraq. Thank you. Time has expired. Uh, Mr. Burton, recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have no objection to this kind of a hearing, but really, what really concerns me is that uh, uh, there appears to be a rush to judgment, and I don't think that should happen. It's going to be thoroughly investigated in Iraq by Iraqis and American uh, officials. And until we get that, we won't know exactly what happened or who might have made a mistake or who might have done something they shouldn't have done. And so while the hearing here is okay, uh, I, I hope everybody, including the media, will know that uh, th this is not the final report on this. There's going to be a complete investigation. I'd like to give you a few facts. There have been 3,073 missions in the last nine months over there by private contractors. There were 77 involving them using weapons. Uh, there have been uh, there have been 54,000 recorded attacks, 6,000 a month, and uh, there have been a lot of these contractors who've lost their lives. Uh, since 2004, there have been 42 security contractors killed, and 76 have been wounded. Uh, this is a time when we should reevaluate or evaluate the procedures that are being used over there. If we find, after the investigation, there have been errors in judgment or somebody made a downright conscious mistake, then things need to be changed. I would just like to say one more time, 
It is important to have these hearings. Congress needs to know what went on has went over there. And, but there should not be a rush to judgment. And I would like to say one other thing. There has not been one Congressman or one public official that has been killed while in, under the protection of these people. And uh, that should account for something. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back to my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Chairman. In light of uh, Mr. the last statement was, that was just made, it is not about Blackwater and what they do that they may have done some good things. The question is, is whether there is accountability. Blackwater, we have to question in this hearing whether it, was, it created a shadow military of mercenary forces that are not accountable to the United States Government or to anyone else. Blackwater appears to have fostered a culture of shoot first and sometimes kill and then ask the questions. Blackwater has been involved in at least 195 escalation of force incidents since 2005, an average of 1.4 shooting incidents per week. We must, ask, we must seriously reassess whether these practices are undermining our ability to accomplish our mission in Iraq. We must also reassess how Blackwater not only affects our mission in Iraq, but also how it may negatively affect our foreign relations efforts in the Middle East, these same neighboring states that we need to utilize as vehicles to spur multilateral and bilateral support as to create a political reconciliation in Iraq. This is about accountability, and I am going to be very interested to hear what Mr. Friends has to say about that accountability. And with that, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. The Chair recognizes Mr. Issa for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it has been made incredibly clear by the previous statements on the Democrat side that this is not about Blackwater. When they talk about being paid six times as much, when they talk about uh, the President shouldn't have gone into this war. When they talk about they talk about what we are hearing today is, in fact, a repeat of the MoveOn.org attack on General Petraeus's patriotism. What we are seeing is that, except for the 79 members who voted against denouncing MoveOn.org, eight of whom are on the dais here today, what we are seeing is what they couldn't do to our men and women in uniform, they will simply switch targets. The bodies were not culled in Iraq before this became a story worth going after here in committee. The second panel today will include people from the State Department who will tell us about the command and control rules, about whether or not Blackwater made mistakes, whether they did their job, and whether they are going to be continued as a contractor. That is appropriate. I am not here to defend Blackwater. But I am here to defend General Petraeus and the men and women in uniform who do their job, who were first denounced by MoveOn.org, then not denounced by members of Congress, many of whom are on the dais today speaking as though they don't support attacking every possible way the administration's war in Iraq. We are going to get to the bottom of what happened on September 16. But quite frankly, when we are done with that, we are still going to have the same problem, with all due respect to the members on the other side of the aisle. We do not want the military guarding State Department personnel. There is a long tradition, in fact, of very limited military guarding of even our embassies, a limited amount of Marines. The fact is the State Department has a surge responsibility in Iraq and Afghanistan. They are meeting with private contractors. When that ends, do we really want to have 1,500 special ops people working for the State Department in career positions? I have looked forward to the debate on that and not on whether this war was ill-founded, which has been the Democrats' mantra. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair would now uh, turn to uh, Mr. Kucinich for two minutes. Mr. Chairman, a British polling agency has determined that more than one million Iraqi citizens have died as a result of the Iraq war. Opinion research business found that the death rate rose. Almost uh, one in two households in Baghdad uh, have lost a family member since the invasion began in 2003. This report confirms the results of a survey released last fall by Lancet, the prestigious medical magazine, which gave a conservative estimate of 650,000 uh, uh, innocent civilian deaths. Uh, now, this great human tragedy is taking place in many forms. In today's hearing, we are investigating Blackwater's uh, outrageous behavior that has killed countless innocent Iraqis. 
and I am deeply concerned that the Department of State appears to have attempted to cover up Blackwater's killings rather than seek appropriate remedies. What are the implications of killing an innocent Iraqi? What is this government's position on the killing of innocent Iraqis by a U.S. Uh, citizen? If war is privatized and private contractors have a vested interest in keeping the war going, the longer the war goes on, the, long, the more money they make. Eighty-four percent of the shooting incidents uh, involving Blackwater uh, are where they fired first, and Blackwater did not remain at the scene. So Blackwater's shoot first and don't ask questions later approach undermines the United States uh, position and jeopardizes the safety of our soldiers. How much more do we need to know to conclude that the war against Iraq has been a disaster for the Iraqi people and for the people of this country as well? I yield back. The gentleman yields back at time. All opening statements have uh, been concluded. Mr. Prince, I'd oh, excuse me, there is one more. Mr. Micah for two minutes. Thank you. Well, let me uh, try to frame the context of this hearing. I've um, been on the committee for some 15 years, and, uh, you know, from the outset, um, the Democrat side and the majority have uh, tried to discredit uh, the President. Uh, in fact, uh, I have a quote from a press release from Chairman Waxman, uh, January 10th, as part of President Bush's revised strategy for Iraq, he appears likely to propose giving large sums of taxpayer dollars to de decrepit and possibly corrupt state-owned Iraqi companies. So we started first in, this, uh, in these hearings to try to discredit the President. We have tried to discredit the Ambassador. We tried to discredit uh, the Secretary of Defense. We did a great job in trying to discredit the military here. Um, and then we worked on the Iraqi government. So now we're down to the, uh, some of the uh, contractors. So this is the hearing to discredit them. And probably one of the reasons why is there's some bad news for the other side. Today, it, it's on page 15. It's a 48 percent uh, drop in, uh, in deaths in Iraq in one month. So they don't want that good news to get out. But on the front page, you want the other killings by Blackwater, uh, the contractors were going after today. Now, if they're really intent on going after the contractors, and, they're, it, and I don't know what happened on the 16th. I don't know what happened in other incidents. But if they're really intent on going after criminal misconduct, then we have a, a letter from the Department of Justice. We have some words about not uh, interfering in this process, but we are interfering with both a Department of State investigation and a criminal uh, misconduct uh, investigation, potentially criminal charges. And, and uh, let, me, let me quote from some of the words. This presents serious challenges for any potential criminal prosecution. And then they cite case law. So my concern, if we really want to do this, we should not, we should not be holding this hearing. Therefore, I move that the committee do now adjourn. Motions before us to adjourn. All those in favor of the motion say aye. aye. Opposed, no. 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 Uh, the no's have it and the motion's defeated. We have a witness now, and I'd like to call forward uh, Eric Prince, who is the um, head of the Prince Group LLC in Blackwater, USA. Mr. Prince, please come forward. Uh, Mr. Uh, Prince, it's the practice of this committee that all witnesses take a, an oath before they testify. If you please raise your right hand. You promise to uh, solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Please be seated. The record will indicate that the witness answered in the affirmative. I do want to say, Mr. Prince, uh, that there have been uh, press reports over the past two weeks regarding the recent incident in, on September 16th, and there have been conflicting accounts of what actually happened on the ground. I know that you would prepare to address this incident today, as did our other witnesses, and no doubt our members did too. So I just want to note that for the record that the request to refrain from public comment came from the Justice Department, not uh, Mr. Prince and not uh, from anyone else, and I want to thank him for complying with that Justice Department request. I, I know you've been prepared to talk about it, but we would uh, ask you please not to go into that incident. 
Uh, before you begin, uh, just uh, push the button on, yeah. button on the mic. Is that better? Yeah. All right. Okay, please uh, proceed however you see fit. Chairman Waxman, Congressman Davis, members of the committee, my name is Eric Prince and I am the chairman and CEO of the Prince Group in Blackwater, USA. Blackwater is a team of dedicated professionals who provide training to America's military and law enforcement communities and risk their lives to protect Americans in harm's way overseas. Under the direction and oversight of the United States government, Blackwater provides an opportunity for military and law enforcement veterans with a record of honorable service to continue their support to the United States. Words alone cannot express the respect I have for these brave men and women who, defend, who volunteer to defend U.S. personnel, facilities, and diplomatic missions. I am proud to be there to represent them today. After almost five years in active service as a U.S. Navy SEAL, I founded Blackwater in 1997. I wanted to offer the military and law enforcement communities assistance by providing expert instruction in world-class training venues. Ten years later, Blackwater trains approximately 500 members of the United States military and law enforcement agencies every day. After 9-11, when the U.S. began its stabilization efforts in Afghanistan and then Iraq, the United States government called upon Blackwater to fill the need for protective services in hostile areas. Blackwater responded immediately. We are extremely proud of answering that call and supporting our country. Blackwater personnel supporting our country's overseas missions are all military and law enforcement veterans, many of whom have recent military deployments. No individual protected by Blackwater has ever been killed or seriously injured. There is no better evidence of the skill and dedication of these men. At the same time, 30 brave men have made the ultimate sacrifice while working for Blackwater and its affiliates. Numerous others have been wounded and permanently maimed. The entire Blackwater family mourns the loss of these brave lives. Our thoughts and our prayers are with their families. The areas of Iraq in which we operate are particularly dangerous and challenging. Blackwater personnel are subject to regular attacks by terrorists and other nefarious forces within Iraq. We are the targets of the same ruthless enemies that have killed more than 3,800 American military personnel and thousands of innocent Iraqis. Any incident where Americans are attacked serves as a reminder of the hostile environment in which our professionals work to keep American officials and dignitaries safe, including visiting members of Congress. In doing so, more American service members are available to fight the enemy. Blackwater shares the committee's interest in ensuring the accountability and oversight of contract personnel supporting U.S. operations. The company and its personnel are already accountable under and subject to numerous statutes, treaties, and regulations of the United States. Blackwater looks forward to working with Congress and the executive branch to ensure that any necessary improvements to these laws and policies are implemented. The Worldwide Personal Protection Services Contract, which has been provided to this committee, was competitively awarded in details almost every aspect of operation and contractor performance, including the hiring, vetting guidelines, background checks, screening, training standards, rules of force, and conduct standards. In Iraq, Blackwater reports to the Embassy's Regional Security Officer, or RSO. All Blackwater movements and operations are directed by the RSO. In conjunction with internal company, procedures and controls, the RSO ensures that Blackwater complies with all relevant contractual terms and conditions as well as any applicable laws and regulations. We have approximately 1,000 professionals serving today in Iraq as part of our nation's total force. Blackwater does not engage in offensive or military missions, but performs only defensive security functions. My understanding of the September 16 incident is that the Department of State and the FBI are conducting a full investigation, but those results are not yet available. We at Blackwater welcome the FBI review announced yesterday and we will cooperate fully and look forward to receiving their conclusions. I just want to put some other things in perspective. A recent uh, report from the Department of State stated that uh, in, in 2007 Blackwater has conducted uh, 1,873 security details for diplomatic visits to the red zone, areas outside the green zone in Iraq. And there have been only 56 incidences in, where, in which weapons were discharged, or less than 3% of all movements. In 2006, Blackwater conducted over 6,500 diplomatic movements in the red zone. Weapons were discharged in less than 1% of those missions. To the extent there is any loss of innocent life ever, let me be clear that I consider that tragic. Every life, whether American or Iraqi, is precious. I stress the committee and to the American public, however, that I believe we acted appropriately at all times. I am prepared to answer your question. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prince. I'm going to start off with the questions. <clears throat> I 
I think my mic's on. The issue before us that I see that's important to understand is we've gone now in a major way to contract out what the government and what the military ordinarily would do. Y your, your company started off uh, at the beginning 2001 with I think around uh, over $200,000 in government contracts. You now are making over a billion dollars a year. That's quite a success. Even if I'm wrong on the exact numbers, it's quite a success. Now, we're paying a lot of money for privatized military to do the work that our military people have done. And no one does this work better than the U.S. military. They're very, very able and brave and courageous people that uh, do a fantastic job for us. So the question in my mind is, are we paying more and getting less? And in answer, asking that question, I want to focus on a particular incident. That uh, incident received uh, almost no public attention, but involved the tragic loss of three of our troops. And my staff has reviewed the documents describing the incident, and they prepared a memo, in which I'd like, without objection, to make part of the record. On November 27, 2004, there was a plane run by Blackwater Aviation that crashed into a wall, a, a canyon in the mountains of Afghanistan. Uh, this uh, plane was carrying three military personnel and uh, three active duty U.S. personnel, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Michael McMahon, Chief Warrant Officer Travis Grogan, and Specialist Harley Miller. About 40 minutes after takeoff, Blackwater 61 crashed into the wall of a canyon and all of the occupants were killed. The crash was investigated a joint, uh, by a joint Army and Air Force Task Force and by the National Transportation Safety Board. The NTSB report found that Blackwater captain and first officer behaved unprofessionally, were deliberately flying the non-standard route low through the valley for fun. The report found that the pilots were unfamiliar with the route, deviated almost immediately after takeoff, and failed to maintain adequate terrain clearance. They also had a transcript of the a uh, cockpit voice recording. And on this recording, the flight crew joked with each other, saying, you're an X-wing fighter Star Wars man, and you're expletive right. This is fun. The captain stated, I swear to God, they wouldn't pay me if they knew how much fun this was, end quote. Mr. Prince, one allegation raised recently about Blackwater's action is that your contractors have acted irresponsibly. One senior U.S. commander told the Washington Post, quote, they often act like cowboys, end quote. Let me ask you about that crash of Blackwater Flight 61. In this case, did Blackwater's pilots act responsibly, or were they, in the words of the U.S. commander, acting like cowboys? I disagree with the assertion that they acted like cowboys. Uh, they, um, we provide a very... Uh, reliable, valuable service uh, to the Air Force and the Army uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, anytime you have an accident, it's an accident. Something could have been done better. Uh, it is not a, um, a Part 135 U.S. type uh, flying operation. There's no flight services. There's no um, uh, flight routes. There's no nav aids. It is uh, truly uh, uh, rugged Alaska style bush flying. Well, the, um, the investigators said from the National Transportation Safety Board that Blackwater Aviation violated its own policies by assigning two pilots without adequate flying experience in Afghanistan. And according to the military report, it was your policy, Blackwater policy, that required at least one of the pilots to have flown in theater for at least a month, but neither pilot had flown for that long and neither had flown the route they were assigned that day. And this is clear in the cockpit voice recording. Right after takeoff, the Blackwater captain said, quote, I hope I'm going into the right valley. The first officer replied, this one or that one? The captain then apparently guessed which valley to fly, saying, I'm just going to go up this one. The flight mechanic later observed, we don't normally go this route. Why didn't Blackwater follow its own policies and uh, team new pilots with more experienced ones? Why did you have two inexperienced pi uh, pilots together? 
Uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, qualified to speak to the experience level of the pilots. I will tell you that uh, we are operating under military control. Uh, in fact, the aircraft was set to take off um, with two passengers on board, and they actually turned around and, uh, for the uh, lieutenant colonel, who I believe who boarded late. There was also, uh, it violated, um, the military violated its policy by loading both ammunition. Uh, that, that aircraft was also flying with uh, uh, a large number of il illumination mortar rounds, and they're not supposed to mix uh, packs and cargo, but again, we, we followed our customers' instructions. Yes, accidents happen. We've provided thousands and thousands of flight hours of reliable service since then. Uh, today, still, we're flying more than, a more than a thousand missions a month. But on that one, the investigators found that Blackwater failed to follow standard precautions to track flights, failed to file a flight plan, failed to maintain emergency communications in case of an accident, and tragically, these failures may have cost the life of the crash is sole survivor because one of the military people that you were escorting or your flight was escorting evidently survived for at least 10 hours after the crash. He suffered internal injuries, but he got out of the plane to urinate. He smoked a cigarette. He rolled out a sleeping bag and nobody came and then he died of cold from inattention. There was no way as, as required for uh, anybody to know where that uh, plane had landed, even though that's a requirement. Um, I, I have a, an email that I want to read to you. It was sent on November 10, 2004, 16 days before the crash. It's from Paul Hooper, Blackwater Afghanistan site manager, and it was sent to John Height, Vice President for Operations for Blackwater Avi Aviations. In it, in it, Mr. Hooper says, Blackwater knowingly hired, hired pilots with background and experience shortfalls. Here's what he wrote. By necessity, the initial group hired to support the Afghanistan operation did not meet the criteria identified in email traffic and had some background and experience shortfalls overlooked in favor of getting the requisite number of personnel on board to start up the contract. One of the great ironies of this uh, accident is that while the aircraft was being piloted by an inexperienced Blackwater pilot, a skilled military pilot with an exemplary safety record, Lieutenant Colonel Michael McMahon was on board the flight as a passenger. And this is what his uh, widow wrote to me. Uh, she is uh, Colonel Jeanette McMahon, and she works at West Point. She said, Mike, like Mr. Prince, was a CEO of sorts in the military as an aviation commander, and as such had amassed a great safety record in his unit. It's ironic and unfortunate that he had to be a passenger on this plane versus one of the people responsible for its safe operation. Some would say it was simply a tragic accident, but this accident was due to the gross lack of judgment in managing this company. Mr. Prince, Colonel McMahon is asking why the taxpayers should be paying your company millions to conduct military transport missions over dangerous ter terrain when the military's own pilots are better trained and a lot less expensive. How do you respond? We were hired to fill that void because there is a different, uh, it's a different kind of airlift mission going in and out of the very short strips in Afghanistan. You have high altitude, short strips, unimproved runways, and you have uh, transport aircraft that are designed to support a large conventional battle. We're doing small missions. Uh, typical CASA payload uh, maxes out at 4,000 pounds. They can't even hold that because of the short altitude or the, the, the high altitude short strips they have to go in and out of. To hauling mail, hauling parts. We're filling that gap because are you these, these, are, these strips are too small for C-17s, they're too small for C-130s, they're going in out of places that the military can't get to with the existing aircraft they have. That's so why we're doing that You're saying that mission. the military could not do this job? They did not have the assets to do it in theater or back in the United States, no sir. And they could have acquired those assets, however, instead they hired you. Uh, I believe uh, the, the Congress has seen fit to proceed with some sort of aircraft uh, acquisition program. Uh, to, to fill that void going forward, but uh, this is a temporary service to fill that gap. Well, we've been in Iraq for five years now. The pilots of Blackwater 61 paid for their errors with their lives, but I'm wondering that whether there was any corporate accountability for Blackwater. Were any sanctions placed on the company after the investigative reports that were so critical of Blackwater were released? Anytime there's an accident, a company always should, could, should be introspective and look back and see what can be done to, to make sure that doesn't happen again. Well, aside from we, your introspection, were you ever penalized in any way? Were you ever fined or 
suspended or reprimanded or placed on probation? I believe the Air Force investigated the incident and they found that it was, uh, uh, it was pilot error. It was not due to corporate error that caused the, uh, the, 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 problem, the, the mistake or the crash of the aircraft. Well, my time's up, but the corporation hired inexperienced pilots. They sent them on a route they didn't know about. They didn't even follow your own rules. It seems to me that it's more than pilot error. There ought to be corporate responsibility, and Blackwater was the corporation involved. Aside from your introspection, you've just been awarded a new contract for almost $92 million. I want to see whether you're getting a stick as well as all these carrots. Mr. Davis, your turn. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Let me just say, I mean, I think if there's a question, if this should be uh, in or out, if the private companies are doing work in the Army, that really ought to be addressed to the Defense Department and the State Department. M Mr. Chairman, would you, and, or Mr. Ranking Member, would you yield for a question? I, I would. Uh, since I wasn't here during the Clinton administration, uh, did Mr. Waxman and this committee investigate Secretary Brown's uh, crash? Uh, in which he was killed. That was a military flight, C-130, C I believe. Was that investigated? I wasn't uh, here. I was not here at that point, but uh, I, I so understand crash, the question. The, the, bad uh, the gentleman would yield to me. That, happy. That, that crash was investigated, and the gentleman would be able to get the report of that investigation. Let me uh, yield five minutes to the gentleman from North Carolina. I thank the ranking member for yielding. Uh, Mr. Prince, uh, can you describe to the committee the nature of your contract who your client is in Iraq? In Iraq, we work for the Department of State. And what is the service you provide for the Department of State? Uh, we operate under the Worldwide Personal Protective Services contract, and we are charged with uh, protecting diplomats, reconstruction officials, um, and visiting uh, CODELs, members of Congress, and their staffs. And in, in the last, uh, since in this calendar year, how many missions have you had in Iraq? Uh, 1,873. How many incidents occurred uh, during those 1,873 um, uh, movements? Only 56 incidents. All right. And a movement is uh, a, for instance, you take uh, a member of Congress lands at the airstrip, they're transported to the embassy. That's one movement. Is that? Yes, sir. All right. And 56 incidents out of 1,873 movements in a war zone. Is that correct? Resulted in a discharge of, of one of our guy's weapons. Which, uh, those 56 incidents, does that mean that they shot at someone? Uh, describe what an incident is. Yes. Uh, we don't even record all the times that our guys receive fire. The vehicles get shot at on a daily basis, multiple times a day. So that's not something we even record. In this case, we have, uh, an incident is a, uh, is a defensive measure. Uh, you are responding to an IED attack followed by a small arms fire. Most of, the co most of the attacks we get in Iraq are complex, meaning it is not just one bad thing, it is a host of bad things. Car bomb followed by a small arms attack, RPGs followed by sniper fire. Um, an incident uh, occurs typically when um, our men fear for their life, they are not able to extract themselves from the situation, they have to use sufficient uh, defensive fire to get off the X, to get off that place where the bad guys have tried to kill Americans that day. So in, in, in 1,873 missions, 56 incidents occurred, which means potentially it means an, the Blackwater uh, individual, the former soldier in most cases, discharges the weapon, perhaps in the air? Is that a possibility? Uh, it is not likely into the air. Uh, it is going to be directed at someone that is shooting at us or the uh, Another real problem, you know, the, the recent Washington Post series on IEDs in Iraq, 81,000 IED attacks. Uh, the bad guys have figured out how to make a precision weapon. You take a car, you pack it with explosives, and you put a suicidal person in there that wants to drive into the back of a convoy and blow themselves up. A a additional question here. So those 56 incidents uh, pretty much all in in involved returning fire. Uh, a, a caravan is, is being shot at, for instance, and you would return fire, or a, a potential car bomb is coming at you and you are returning? A potential car bomb, yes. A defensive fire or a potential car bombs going, uh, potentially coming near you, you have to uh, warn them off. There is so a whole series uh, on the use of force continuum our guys uh, are briefed and they abide by. They are briefed on it through their training back here in the United States 
Every time they leave the wire, every time they launch on that mission before they go in the morning, they get the mission brief, what they're going to do, who they're protecting, where they're going, the intelligence, what to be on the lookout for, where have there been particularly bad areas in the city, and the use of force continuum, those rules of engagement. Use of force continuum, is that dictated by the Department of State? Yes. And you use their rules of engagement, the commonly used term? Yes, sir. Is that a, is that similar to the Department of Defense rules of engagement? Yes, they're, uh, All right. they're, they're essentially now, the same. Okay, so you well, had, no, you had Depart Department, sorry, Depart Department of Defense rules for contractors. We do okay. not have the same as a U.S. soldier at all. Okay. Uh, and in the report that I have in 2006, you had 6,254 missions in 38 instances, yes, uh, which, mean, which means a, one of the contractors, one of the former soldiers who uh, is now in uh, State Department Protective Service, um, they returned fire. So that would be less than 1% uh, of missions involved returning fire. Question here. Um, how long has Blackwater been involved in Iraq? How long have you had this contract in Iraq? Uh, we started there first working for DOD under the CPA, and then I believe in 05 it transitioned from CPA over to Department How many of State. individuals under your protective service have been injured or killed? 27 dead and uh, hundreds wounded. And now, how many individuals? Oh, under our care? under your care that you are protecting? Zero. Zero. Zero, sir. Zero individuals that Blackwater's protected have been killed in a, in a Blackwater transport. That's, that's correct. Zero. Zero. That is, I think, uh, the operable number here. Uh, your, your client is the State Department. Your, the State Department uh, has a contract with you to provide protective service for their uh, visitors. For instance, CODELs, uh, ambassadors uh, and, and runs the gamut. And you've had zero individuals under your care and protection killed. I Correct. think that is a very Mr. important McHenry. number that we need to discuss here, Mr. Chairman, and that should be uh, you know, a, a testament to the service that, that these former veterans, these veterans Five minutes that is, are currently you, working for Blackwater, over. and I'm happy to yield back to the ranking member. Mr. Prince, let me just continue with that. Um, are there any other security firms in Iraq that provide the services that involve as much danger as your escort services that your company provides uh, in Baghdad? Um, sir, we certainly have a, uh, a high-profile mission. We protect the U.S. Ambassador. We protect all the diplomats uh, in the greater Baghdad area, which is the hottest part of the country by far. How is your firm paid under the current task order contract for security details? Is it by the mission, by the hour, or some other method? How do you bill the government? It's generally billed on a uh, per man day for every day that the operator is in the country. Is it a cost plus a fee or is it just on a, a, like a time and materials? Uh, it's blended. Most of it is firm fixed price. There's a few things that are uh, directly cost reimbursable like insurance. Okay. Uh, does the contract provide for monetary penalties for any performance difficulties like a shooting incident that were reported to have occurred and, and uh, the like? Yes, there's all sorts of penalty clauses if we don't have it fully manned. If um, they're not happy with the leadership. We are very responsive if there's someone that uh, doesn't agree or is not operating within the standards of the Department of State. They have two decisions, window or aisle. Do you work just for the Department of State or do you work for Defense Department as well? Uh, in Iraq, we essentially work for the Department of State. There's one or two folks here or there in a consultant type position, but nothing, uh, nothing significant, yeah, nothing it's armed. It's important for the committee to understand there are two different contracting entities that are contracting in Iraq and state. You, you work for state. Do you think the contract uh, provisions uh, and the State Department contract management personnel provide sufficient guidance uh, for the use of force under the contract? Yes, sir. Uh, we've seen the, uh, the full gamut of uh, contracting and contract management um, in the stabilization section or stabilization phase of, of the Iraq war. And okay. there's a whole host of, of, of differences in, in oversight. And I will tell you, State Department is the highest. They are the, the GE-like buyers, the most sophisticated oversight standards that we have to comply with on the front end for our personnel and management in the field. When your uh, teams are operating on the ground in Baghdad, what entity has the authority to control your activities? Is it the State Department or is it the military commander who is responsible for the battle space? Uh, we work for the RSO, the Regional Security Officer. He is the Chief Security Official for the State Department in Iraq. 
So it's the State Department ultimately yes. that you're contracting. And can you describe the process that's followed under the contract when a shooting incident occurs? And how many employees have you, have you dismissed any employees for shooting incidents under your security contracts in Iraq? And what happens to dismissed employees? Are they sent out of Iraq? Okay, let me answer the last one first. It's fine. Um, if there is a, uh, uh, any sort of discipline problem, uh, whether it's bad attitude, a dirty weapon, riding someone's bike that's not his, we fire them. We, we hold ourselves internally accountable very high. We fire them, we can find them, but we can't do anything else. So if there's uh, any incident uh, where we believe wrongdoing is done, we present that uh, incident, uh, any incident, any time a weapon is discharged, there's an incident report given to the RSO. And any they, idea uh, how many employees you fired uh, over the time? I think in the, uh, the committee's report they said 122 or something. So you over have taken action when it's come to your attention? Say again, sir? So you've taken action when it's come to your attention? Uh, it generally comes to our attention first. We as a company, we fire them. We send the uh, termination notice to the State Department as to why we fired someone. Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Ms. Maloney for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd, I'd like to uh, ask you, Mr. Prince, about one of these employees whom you fired. And uh, this was an employee who got drunk on Christmas Eve of 2006. And according to documents that we got yesterday from the State Department, uh, this particular man, while he was drunk, shot and killed the guard to the Iraqi vice president, obviously causing great tensions between the Iraqi government and the United States military. And I'd, I'd like to ask you about his firing. You, you fired this individual for, for handling a weapon and for being intoxicated, is that right? The men operate with a uh, clear policy uh, if there is to be any alcohol consumed, it's uh, uh, eight hours between any time of consumption was of alcohol. Was he fired or not? Excuse me? Was, was he fired? Oh, yes, ma'am. He was okay. fired. Have any charges been brought against him in the Iraqi justice system? Uh, I don't believe in the Iraqi justice system. Uh, okay. I do believe, I know we've referred it over to the... Um, justice Department, they told us they're still looking at it nine months later. Have any charges been brought against him in the U.S. military justice system? I don't know. Have any charges been brought against him in the U.S. civilian justice system? Well, that would be handled by the Justice Department, ma'am. That's, that's for them to answer, not me. Other than uh, firing him, has there been any sanction against him uh, by any government authority? You mentioned you fined people for bad behavior. Was he fined for killing the Iraqi guard? Yes, he was. How much was he fined? Uh, multiple thousands of dollars. I don't know the exact number. I'll, I'll have to get you that answer. Okay. Look, I'm not going to make any apologies for what he did. Okay, he clearly but, violated our policies. All right. I, we, 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 we all, every American believes he violated uh, policies. If he lived in America, he would have been arrested and he would be facing criminal charges. If he was a member of our military, he would be under a court martial. But it appears to me that Blackwater has special rules. That's one of the reasons of this hearing. Now, within 36 hours of the shooting, he was flown out of Iraq. And did Blackwater arrange for this contractor to leave Iraq less than two hours after the shooting? Uh, I do not believe we arranged for him to leave after two hours after the shooting. He was, uh, he was arrested. Okay, what about two days? It was two days after the shooting. Did, you arra did Blackwater arrange for him leave to leave the country? Th there could easily be. Uh, okay. IZ police arrested him. Okay, then. Uh, there was I evidence know. gathered. There was information turned over to the Justice Department office in Baghdad. We fired him. He certainly didn't have a job with us. Well, in America, if you committed a, a crime, you don't pack him up and ship him out of the country in two days. If you're really concerned about accountability, which you testified in your testimony, you would have gone in and, and, and done a thorough investigation. And, uh, and because this shooting took place within the green zone, this was a controllable situation. You could have gone in and done forensic and all the things that they do, but the response was to pack him up and have him leave the country within two, two days. 
And I'd like to ask you, how do you justify sending him away from Iraq when any investigation would have only just begun? Again, he was fired. The Justice Department was investigating in Baghdad. There is a Justice Department office there. He didn't have a job with us anymore. We as a private company cannot detain him. We can fire, we can fine, but we can't do anything else. The State what, Department, what evidence the State do you Department, have? What evidence do you have that the Justice Department was investigating him at that time? From talking to my program management people in the country, they said it's in the hands of the the IZ police, which is Air Force, arrested him. They took him in for questioning. It was handled by the Justice Department. He was fired by us. State well, Department it's been ordered 10 months and the Justice Department has not done anything to him. Again, I repeat, if he was a U.S. citizen or in America, he would have been arrested immediately. He would have faced criminal charges. Uh, we know about the chain of command in the military. They, have, they are court-martialed Im immediately. But if you work for Blackwater, you get packed up and you leave within two days and you, and you face a $1,000 fine. Uh, so I am uh, concerned about accountability and uh, really the unfairness of this. And I, I am concerned about how Blackwater may, if I could just say, Mr. Chairman, that your actions may be undermining our mission in Iraq and really hurting the relationship and trust between the Iraqi people and the American military. General Lady's time has expired. Mr. Burton. Can you tell us, Mr. Prince, uh, how many people witnessed the incident she just referred to? I don't believe anyone did, sir. So the only people who were involved were the man who was shot and your employee? Yes, sir. Can you, in some detail, go into the rules of engagement? Uh, I've talked to some of the people at State Department about this, and I've talked to people within your organization. And as I understand it, on the back of every one of your vehicles, in both Arabic and English, there is a warning to not get, not get within 100 meters of that vehicle. Is that correct? Yes, that's right, sir. And if somebody's coming at your vehicle at a high rate of speed, uh, do your employees have any uh, actions that they should take, uh, especially if it might be a car bomb or something like that? Yes, sir. There's uh, generally lights and sirens on the vehicles, air horn. Um, the, the personnel whose uh, security sector is, is facing back uh, towards that oncoming threat would be giving uh, hand signals, audible uh, um, yelling, stop, kif, uh, Arabic, uh, for stop. Uh, there's a pen flare, which is a signaling device, kind of like a, uh, a bottle rocket. It's a device used for um, a pilot to signal his whereabouts on the ground to be rescued, but it's a bright uh, incendiary device that flies by the, the, the vehicle or it hits the vehicle. It's not lethal at all, but it definitely, you know something's happening. Uh, water bottles are sometimes thrown at uh, vehicles to, to warn them off. Uh, if you have to go beyond that, they take uh, shots into the radiator. You hear that hitting the car. It, uh, it disables the car. You definitely, um, you know something's happening. If they go beyond that, they have spider the windshield. You put around through the center of the windshield away from the occupants so that the, uh, the safety glass in the windshield makes it uh, difficult to see through. Only after that do they actually direct any shots towards the driver. So there's a whole use of force continuum. The questions that I've uh, heard today from the other side uh, indicate that uh, there ought to be perfection in your organization. Uh, you're a Navy SEAL and you've served in the military. Do you believe that any kind of military operation of this type or any type uh, can be absolutely perfect all the time? I'm afraid not, sir. We strive for perfection. We try to drive towards the highest standards, but uh, the, the fog of war and accidents and the bad guys just have to get lucky once. I think it's very important that everybody who's involved in this hearing today understand that you have high public officials, congressmen and others, who you have to protect, and you've indicated that nobody's been killed or hurt under your protection, and yet you're going through all kinds of zones where there's car bombs going off, uh, small arms fire, cars coming at you at high rates of speed. Uh, 
Can you explain to me why in the world there wouldn't be some precautions taken uh, when those sorts of things uh, take place? Again, the bad guys have figured out um, killing Americans is, uh, is big media. I think um, uh, they're trying to drive us out. They try to drive to the heart of uh, American resolve and will to stay there. So we have to provide that protective screen. We only play defense. And our job is to get those uh, reconstruction officials, those people that are trying to weave the fabric of Iraq back together, to get them away from that X, the place where the bad guys, the terrorists, have decided to kill them that day. One of the members on the other side indicated that when there is a firefight or when there's a, a, a car bomb go off or something, uh, there's an attack on uh, your convoy, that uh, you don't stay there. Uh, can you explain to me what would happen if you stayed there when you were under attack? Again, there'd be a lot more firefight. There'd be a lot more shooting. Our job is to get them off the X. The X is what we refer to in, in our business about uh, the pre-planned ambush site where bad guys have planned to kill you. So our job is to get them away from that X, to get them to a safe place. Well, so we can't stay and secure the terrorist crime scene investigation. You're in a war zone. Yes, sir. Now, so the instructions, I want to get this straight. If your, your people come under fire, or there's a car bomb or a, a, a RPG fired at them, they're uh, supposed to turn around under some rules and get out of there to protect the people that they're guarding. Yes, sir. Defensive fire, uh, sufficient force to extricate ourselves from that dangerous situation. We're not there to achieve firepower dominance or to, uh, to drive the insurgents back. We're there to get uh, our package away from danger. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Cummings for five minutes. Mr. Prince, um, you are a very impressive witness. And um, I just want to ask you a few questions um, that caused me some concern that seems to go counter to some of the things that you have said. Um, and I am wondering whether Blackwater is, is actually helping our military or hurting them. Uh, frankly, I'm concerned that the ordinary Iraqi may not be able to distinguish military actions from contractor actions. They, they view them all as American actions. Now, I want to go back to this incident that we've been talking about for the last few minutes, the 2006 Christmas Eve incident, where the drunken Blackwater official shot and killed a guard of the Iraqi vice president, which is basically like killing a Secret Service person guarding our vice president. When this incident first happened, an Arab television station ran an incorrect story saying that a, quote, drunken U.S. soldier, unquote, killed the Iraqi vice president's guard. Were you aware of this incorrect uh, press report? No, sir, I was not. Of course, you can see how a media report like that makes it more likely that Iraqis will blame the United States military rather than Blackwater for the killing of the Iraqi Vice President's guard, again, equivalent of our Vice President. Did Blackwater take any steps to inform the press that it was actually a Blackwater employee who killed the Vice President's guard? Uh, by contract, we are not allowed to engage with the press. All right. And why is that? Uh, that's part of the stipulations in the WPPS contract. And this report aired, <clears throat> after this report aired, an official who works for you, and this is what really concerns me, and I just want to know your reaction to this. At Blackwater sent an email, this is an employee of yours, an email internally to some of his colleagues. He did not suggest contacting the station, I guess for the reason you just said. He didn't suggest putting out a press release, and he didn't suggest correcting the false story in any way. Instead, this is what the email said, quote, at least the ID of the shooter will take the heat off of us, meaning Blackwater. In other words, he was saying, wow, everyone thinks it was the military and not Blackwater. What great news for us. What a silver lining. Mr. Prince, you said in your testimony that Blackwater is extremely proud of answering the call and supporting our country. Did anyone in your organization ever raise any concerns that allowing a false story to continue might lead to retaliation, to retaliation or insurgent activity against our troops? Uh, I don't believe that false story lasted in the media for more than a few hours, sir. But the fact still remains that it was a false story, and we are trying to be supportive of the Iraqi government, trying to get this reconciliation, trying to make sure that they, as President Bush says, says that, says that they stand up, 
so that, so that we can stand down. But at the same time, when these stories are put out, I think you would agree that the Iraqi people then say, well, wait a minute. This is, a, this is the United States is supposed to be supporting our government. President Bush talks about how he, how we have gone over to export democracy. Here is a very symbol, the vice president of the country, of a country killed by a drunken Blackwater employee, and yet and still it just seems to, you know, it, the, the question is, is then what lies in the mind of the Iraqi? What my, lies in the mind of those people who may have wanted to cooperate with our security uh, over there, but then they say, well, wait a minute. If, if they, United States soldiers, but it really Blackwater is doing this to the very government that we are supposed to be supporting, then what does that say and why should we support the United States? Fair question? Yes, sir. Uh, look, I'm not going to make any apologies for the- I'm not uh, asking you to make any apologies. You're the president of this company, is that right? Uh, CEO. CEO. Well, you're the, you're the top guy. You're one of the top guys. Is that right? Pretty much, yes, All sir. right. So I'm just asking you a question about what your policies are. That's all. We have clear policies. Uh, whether the guy was involved in a, uh, a shooting that night or not, the fact that he violated the alcohol policy with firearms would have gotten him fired on the spot. Uh, that's why we fire people. We hold them in independently accountable. Uh, the guy slipped away from the party. He was by himself. I'm confident that if he had been with uh, another guy from Blackwater, the other guy would have stopped him and said, enough, you know. Uh, so contrary again, to we, what we, Mr. Burton said, this was uh, after hours in the green zone, wasn't it? This wasn't some mission, was it? Under correct. It was, right. on his, it, was on, it was on his own time. And do you understand? It was that, a I Christmas mean, Eve party. And I've heard so not a, a lot of complimentary things about what you all do, and I'm sure you do a great job. But it's not about, it's not about what you do well. It's the question of when things go wrong, where is the accountability? And sir, we fired him, we fined him, but we as a private organization can't do any more. We can't flog him, we can't incarcerate him. That's up to the Justice Department. We are not empowered to enforce U.S. Do law. Think, do you think more should be done? I'd be happy to see further investigation and prosecution by the Justice Department, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I want to call on Mr. Micah next, but how much did you fine him? Uh, multiple thousands of dollars, sir. I, I don't know the exact number, but uh, whatever we had left uh, do him in pay, I believe we withheld, and plus his plane ticket. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Um, Micah. Thank you. Mr. Prince, uh, in your uh, testimony earlier, you said, uh, let me quote here, killing Americans, I guess, in Iraq is big media. Uh, you said that? Yes, sir. Did you have any idea that wounding uh, American contractors uh, in a congressional hearing would uh, be this big a media? More than I bargained for, sir, <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I describe, you know, you're, you're here because you're sort of in the chain of command to be attacked uh, next by, uh, by some folks who uh, want to discredit what you're doing. And um, I might say that I don't know if there were criminal acts committed, and there will probably be ways in which uh, we can go after folks. One of those would be have the Department of Justice uh, uh, pursue the case. Isn't that the, w would that be the normal uh, procedure? Yes, sir. We welcome it. We encourage it. We want that accountability. We hold ourselves internally accountable. But if, you know, we put a thousand guys out in the field, uh, humans make mistakes and they do stupid things sometimes. We try to catch those as much as we can, but if they go over the line, well, they, they criticized you. I guess we, we could start with the pilots uh, and the NTSB investigation. Uh, they should go back and look at the Com Air uh, crash in Kentucky with the accounts of the pilots, which was a distraction and led to the crash, according to their findings. Uh, I chair, uh, have chaired the aviation subcommittee and followed that very closely, let alone an incident with the, uh, basically, uh, there's no, uh, as Al Gore would put it, there's no controlling authority for airspace in, in uh, Afghanistan. There is no FAA in Afghanistan. And then uh, you were criticized, too. You let the pilot, I guess he survived, but was not found. Is that the was? No, no. There was uh, the, the two, DOD, two of the DOD personnel in back uh, survived the survived. crash. Okay. Well, two survived and weren't found. And, uh, and I guess they perished? They, yeah. they perished before they were found. Uh, and I guess in the United States, uh, like we have an experienced pilot like Fawcett, he's lost. Uh, have we found him yet? Uh, no, sir. Okay. 
but this is in the, what, terrain? Uh, uh, of terrain very similar to what is in Nevada. Uh, yeah, uh, so, uh, okay, I just, just want to try to put things in perspective. Uh, there's also some argument that w you cost the government too much uh, and, and that, that you're getting paid too much and uh, uh, that uh, maybe this is some, something that the military should be uh, doing. Uh, could you respond to that? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I think there's, there's three arguments for or against privatization. There's reliability, there's accountability, and there's cost. Accountability issues can be handled by uh, uh, exercising media, Congress expanded media at the end of 2004 to, to any DOD uh, contingency operation, I believe. So anytime a U.S. contractor is abroad, they can be brought up on charges uh, on behalf of the U.S. government, they can be brought up on charges back here in the States. Uh, there's reliability. That comes down to, I think, individual uh, vendor reliability. How well does that company execute? Are they complete, correct, and on time? And then there's cost. The American automotive industry, any manufacturer in America has to deal with that cost issue all the time. Whether they should make something, uh, it's that make versus buy argument. I greatly encourage Congress to do, do some true activity-based cost studies. What is what are some of these basic government functions really cost? Because I don't believe uh, it's as simple as saying, well, this sergeant costs us this much. Because that sergeant doesn't show up there naked and uh, un untrained. There's a whole bunch of other costs that go into it. So figure out if the Army does a job, how many of those people leave the wire every day? What is their tooth to tail ratio? How many people are operators versus how many are support people? That all drives into what your, your total cost is. Uh, now, American you, industry got pushed by the Japanese car makers and you know, by foreign competitors because you've got to focus on, on cost and being efficient, delivering a, a good or a product or a service at a better competitive price. Finally, you were criticized for not detaining someone who committed a criminal act. Now, if an employee commits a criminal act in the United States uh, and uh, you fire him, are you responsible in the United States for detaining him and, and you know, uh, handling the... Uh, well, that would be a crime that we committed then because we're not allowed to detain. You're, you're not allowed to detain in the... No, sir. Okay. So, uh, in, in that situation, you were criticized for uh, providing uh, someone transport back, was it to the United States? Uh, he was... Or wherever. We, we, acquired, we acquired airline an airline ticket for him back to the States. Uh -huh. That's all. But By Gentlemen, direction of the State Department. has Thank expired. Now the Chair recognizes Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. In my opening remarks, I pointed out that if war is privatized, private contractors have a... Uh, best an interest in keeping the war going. The longer the war goes on, the more money they make. Uh, I want to, uh, for my time here, explore the uh, questions regarding how Blackwater got its contracts. Uh, Mr. Prince, your company's undergone a staggering growth uh, just over the past few years. Uh, the committee's attention can be directed to the chart. In 2000, your company was bringing in only about 200,000 in government contracts. But since then, according to the committee, uh, you've skyrocketed to something in the nature of a billion dollars in government contracts. The uh, real increase in Blackwater's contracts began with the Iraq War. In fact, if you look at the chart, you can see how from 2004 on, the amount of taxpayer dollars Blackwater was awarded by the administration uh, began to go through the roof from about 48 million in 2004 to 350 million in 2005 to over 500 million last year. This is really an unprecedented rate of increase and I'm, I want to understand how this happened, Mr. Prince. We've been informed that one of your first contracts in Iraq was for the Coalition, uh, Coalition Provisional Authority. Ambassador Paul Bremer awarded uh, you a contract to protect officials and dignitaries. Uh, that was at the end of 2003 uh, towards the end of 2003. It may have been in August. Is that right, sir? Uh, I believe uh, it happened right after the UN facility in Baghdad was blown up by a large truck bomb. Yes, sir. They it's then not, feared for the uh, U.S. officials. Now, that, that contract was no bid. Is that right, sir? Uh, it was off the GSA schedule. Uh, can you tell us uh, uh, how you got this no bid contract? Uh, off the GSA schedule is considered a bid contract, sir. 
the GSA schedule is a uh, uh, is a pre-bid program, kind of like a uh, catalog of services that you put out, like buying something from the Sears catalog. Did you uh, talk to anyone in the White House about the contract? No, sir. Did you talk to anyone in the Congress about the contract? No, sir. Did anyone, did anyone to your knowledge, uh, connected with Blackwater, talk to anyone in either the White House or the Congress about the contract? Not to my knowledge, no. Um, did anyone in the uh, DeVos family talk to anyone in the White House or the Congress about the contract? No. Uh, as a taxpayer, do you think it's uh, proper that no other companies were allowed to bid? Uh, that I'm not aware of, sir. That's a, it's a requirement government officials had. They came to us, asked if uh, it could be fulfilled. I don't know what other companies they went to as well. I'm not aware of that. In 2004, the State Department uh, awarded Blackwater a $332 million task order under its uh, diplomatic uh, protection co uh, contract. Are you familiar with that? Uh, I'm familiar with the, about the amount. I know that um, we transitioned over to working for the State Department from the CPA. Now, I'm not sure exactly when that happened. but Thank you, sir. Uh, according to the Federal Contracting Database, you didn't have to compete for that one either. Is that correct? Uh, again, I believe they continued that off the GSA schedule, and, and which, is a, which is an approved contracting pre-bid method. And who at the State Department were you dealing with in order to get this contract? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I presume uh, it, was under the me? it was under the Diplomatic Security Service. That was the, that's the folks at State we were working for. Uh, now, SIGIR, SIGIR, uh, reported that uh, this was a no-bid contract. Are you, uh, was SIGIR incorrect? Was this it was a no-bid contract? Or uh, I'm not sure how they're defining bid or no-bid, but in my understanding, they used pri we used pricing off the GSA schedule, and I, I believe that's considered or uh, regarded as a, um, uh, as a biddable contract. Uh, Gentlemen, yield to me. I'll, I'll yield to the chair. Uh, it, it, it's on the GSA schedule. Did they come to you to put your offer of services on the GSA schedule? Did you go to them? How did that get on the GSA schedule? Oh, uh, most companies in our kind of work have a GSA schedule. We have a GSA schedule for target systems. We have a GSA schedule for... So you offered services and you're on the list of services that they yes, can purchase. And you don't know if anybody else was on the list. You were the, for these kind of services. Oh, I'm sure there's lots of companies that are... For some of the services. Did, did you go to anyone else or did anyone else in the government go to you to ask you to do the work? Uh, I don't know, sir. Did they ask you to, to see if you could put together this operation and then they'd put you on the schedule? Uh, I would say um, we, were, we were present in the, in the country already. We already had significant presence uh, with the CPA under a bid contract. I believe that contract was called Security Services Iraq. So we had a large presence of static guards and PSD kind of work for them. So I think they, uh, they probably just wanted to transition from DOD work to Department of State work. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I didn't make an opening statement, and I was uh, chairman of the National Security Subcommittee and ranking member, and so I have a keen interest in this issue, but other members had important statements to make. But So first, I'd like to make an observation. Uh, I want to align myself with the statement of Tom Davis, my ranking member now. I thought it, it adequately, it perfectly expresses my view. And I want to thank both the chairman and Mr. Davis for uh, honoring the uh, U.S. Department of Justice's request to not discuss an incident we don't have enough facts to discuss, and we'll deal with that later, and I think that's responsible. And I think this hearing, the way we're dealing with it, is a very important effort, given what we're doing. Now, saying that, during the Vietnam War, I was a conscientious objector. I was a Peace Corps volunteer, so I try to be very careful when I evaluate the performance of men and women under fire and frankly, many of those uh, behind you in this desk are exactly that. We're behind a desk, never been shot at, never tried to understand what it's like to be under fire. Blackwater, I want to say, has a reputation of being a bit of a cowboy. Um, and, uh, but I know we absolutely need protective security contractors. The role of security contractors is, is much different than the role of the military. Uh, but I also want to say that I feel the State Department could do a better job 
of enforcing uh, and holding contractors accountable. And I think they're going to make a point that, that they're uh, willing to have this reviewed by, by outside party and then have us look at it. Now, saying that, I also want to say the number of times that you all have to protect members of Congress is infinitesimal compared to all the civilians you have to protect. And one of the outrages in my judgment is that there haven't been more members who've gone there. And frankly, that some members who have never been there are passing judgment on what we're doing there. They're behind a desk with no sense of what's happening there. I am in awe of what your men and women, and they've been mo mostly men, have done to protect our civilians. I am absolutely in awe of it. You know, you can't be perfect, but in one way you have been perfect. If this is true, tell me in two th and, and from June of 04 to the end of that year, how many uh, missions you protected, or let me say it this way, if you don't know how many missions you protected, how many people you protected were wounded or killed in 04? Oh, end of 04. no, sir, we've never had anyone seriously injured. I'm going to do it year by year. Did you have anyone wounded or killed in 04? No, sir. Did you have anybody wounded or killed in 05? No, sir. These are the people you're trying to protect. I mean, w wounded, yeah, big IED, ruptured eardrum. That's the most serious level there. Did you have anyone wounded or killed in 06? In people that were protecting? Yes. No. Did you have anyone who was wounded or killed in 07 that you were to protect? No, sir. That's a perfect record. And you don't get any credit for it for some reason. Now, did any of your people, were any of your people killed in 04 trying to protect the civilians? Yes, sir. Were any of your people killed in 05 trying to protect civilians? Yes, sir. Were any of your people killed in 06 trying to protect civilians? Yes, sir. Were any of your people protected in trying to, uh, killed by trying to protect the civilians in 07? Yes, sir. Every year, you have had men who have risked their lives and who have been killed fulfilling their mission, and they have succeeded 100%. And I just want to be on record as thanking you for an amazing job that you do. I've been to Iraq 18 times. I've been outside the umbrella four times. It is one dangerous place. I have seen films where vehicles come up to, to our troops or to our security people, and they're blown up in it. You have done an amazing task, and there is a huge difference from being a police officer or protective and being the military, totally different role. I've had no one in the military say to me, I want to guard all these civilians. And the last thing you want is to have Humvees and Army take civilians who are meeting other civilians, like our State Department, with that kind of precedent. And the military would not do it. They're not going to be in a suburban. They're going to be in what their protocol requires. The protocol is totally different. We need security people who do their job. Thank you for doing a perfect job in protecting the people you're required to protect. Thank I you, sir. Back. It's an honor to do the work. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, before I recognize uh, Mr. Uh, Davis, I want to put in the record a statement from the uh, Special Inspector General in Iraq from July 04 that indicates that the uh, security guards and two helicopters for Bremer, sole source directed the uh, security for uh, inner ring re Republican presidential campaign Al Rashid Hotel, sole source. Uh, the security for Al Rashid Hotel, sole source uh, to Blackwater. Uh, Reserving my right to object, would the gentleman say was that uh, under the Bremer or after Bremer? Uh, this is an 04, so it would have been. So it was Bremer. under Mr. Bremer, not since we transferred power to the Iraqis. I, I don't know the answer to that, but okay. this document only uh, refers to the uh, period of time. Uh, under Mr. Bremer, oh, I, I, would, you'll, I don't object. Mr. Chairman, may I have a, Mr. Chairman, may I have a minute, please? May I have a minute, please? One minute, please. Thank you. We'll take, oh, yes.
Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Prince, throughout your testimony and in other comments attributed to you, you have praised the Blackwater personnel on the ground in Iraq, but mistakes do, in fact, happen. You do admit that Blackwater personnel have shot and killed innocent civilians, don't you? Uh, no, sir. I, I disagree with that. I think there's been uh, times when guys are using uh, defensive force uh, to protect themselves, to protect the, the package they're trying to get away from danger. Um, there could be ricochets. There are traffic accidents. Yes, they're, they're, this is war. Uh, you know, in, since 2005, we consider, we've, we've conducted in excess of 16,000 missions in Iraq and 195 incidences with weapons discharge. In that time, did a ricochet hurt or kill an innocent person? That's entirely possible. But again, we do not have the, uh, the luxury of staying behind to do that terrorist crime scene investigation to figure out what happened. Well, according to a document we obtained from the State Department on June 25th, 2005, Blackwater guards shot and killed an innocent man who was standing by the side of the street. His death left six children alone with no one to provide them support. Are you familiar with this incident? Uh, I'm somewhat familiar with that incident. Uh, I believe what happened, that was a car bomb or a potential car bomb uh, had um, rapidly approached our convoy. I believe our guys shot uh, rounds at the car, not at the driver, uh, to warn them off. One of those rounds, as I understand, penetrated through the far side of the car, ricocheted, and, uh, and injured that innocent, or killed that innocent man. Well, again, let me, let me, Go ahead, sir. According to the State Department document, this was a case, and I'm quoting, involving the PSD personnel who failed to report the shooting, covered it up, and subsequently were removed from Al Hilla. The State Department described the death as, and I quote, the random death of an innocent Iraqi. Do you know why Blackwater officials failed to report this shooting and later tried to cover it up? Uh, I can clarify that fully, sir. Thanks for asking that question. Um, there was no cover up because our people reported it to the State Department. Uh, they did look into the, the, the shooting and the justification of it, and it was deemed to be an appropriate use of force. The man was fired because he had tried to cover it up. He panicked uh, and had asked the other team members to cover it up and to not report it. What was there? We, we discovered that through our, I mean, our, our policy worked. We reported the incident to the State Department, and that's why you folks have it in the committee, because we fired the guy. And he was terminated not for uh, an inappropriate shooting, but for not, pol not following the reporting procedure. Well, was there any reason this report was not provided to the committee? Uh, I don't know, sir. I'll have to uh, I'll look into that and get back to you. Well, the same document states that the State Department contacted Blackwater headquarters to encourage you to offer this man's family compensation. After the shooting of an innocent man and after the attempted cover-up, Blackwater paid $5,000 to the family. Is that not correct? Uh, I believe that was paid through the State Department. That's similar to what DOD does, what the Army does, if there is a, uh, an accidental death from a, um, whether it's a, an, an aerial bomb, a tank backs over somebody's car or injures someone, there is compensation paid uh, to try to make amends. But that was done through the State Department. That was not paid to try to hush it up or cover it up. That is uh, part of the, the regular course of action. And there was no cover up because we discussed, you know, our guys reported the incident and the company fired him for not reporting Well, can the you incident. tell me how it was determined that this man's life was worth $5,000? Uh, we don't determine that, that value, sir. That's, uh, that's kind of a, a, an Iraq-wide policy. We don't make that one. Do you know how many payments Blackwater has made to compensate innocent Iraqis or their families for deaths or injuries caused by Blackwater personnel? I do not know that, sir. Uh, do you know what the uh,
total value of those payments might be? No, sir. Could you supply the committee with, with that information? Yes, sir. I'll make sure we get it back to you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Chairman, what I'm concerned about is the lack of accountability. If one of our soldiers shoots an innocent Iraqi, he or she can face a military court martial. But when a Blackwater Guard does this, the State Department helps arrange a payout to make the problem go away. This seems to be a double standard and is causing all kinds of problems in Iraq. Gentlemen's time has expired, Mr. Plants. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate your holding this hearing. And uh, Mr. Prince, I appreciate your testimony and, and want to thank you personally for your five years of service to our nation as a Navy SEAL and also having been to Iraq five times for the uh, dedication of your colleagues uh, for uh, delegations I've been part of and certainly many others as well. Uh, we're, we're grateful for their courageous, uh, courageous service. Um, your contract, um, and it's been discussed already, is under the Worldwide Personal Protective Services contract. And my understanding is under that contract there are specific terms of conduct, including rules of engagement with the use of force. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That is correct. The, um, you you uh, testified about, um, as an example of your seriousness with which your company takes the conduct of your employees of 122 individuals that have been fired for misconduct. Are you able to give us um, what number of those were related to violations regarding the use of force, rules of engagement specifically? Uh, I believe the committee report listed it. Uh, don't quote me on it. I think it says in the, in the committee report around 10 or uh, 15. And, but I'm not and, sure. It's whatever the committee report. And you said. accept that, that information uh, as a act? Yeah, no, that's a, a weapons violation. That could also mean a dirty gun or possession of some unauthorized firearm. We have very clear rules. We are only issued, um, the government issues us our weapons, uh, even down to scopes. We're, we're specified as to which optical device we can put on the weapon. Some guys get fired because they put a, they like a, uh, an aim point instead of an ACOG. So uh, of those 10 to 15, they may not all be related to use of force, misuse of force? Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. Um, a number of times you were asked about, in addition to firing and fining and, and removing the person from your employment uh, and, and from Iraq, about what criminal actions you took. And, and you uh, appropriately stated that you're not a, a law enforcement entity, you're a private company. Uh, that being said, though, uh, is it accurate to say that where there is a criminal investigation by the Department of Justice or Department of State pursuing uh, that you provide any information that your company has about misconduct? Uh, to yes, them? we fully cooperate uh, in the Christmas Eve incident and uh, any other ones that uh, State Department or Justice Department wants to look at. Okay. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's uh, all my questions. And again, my thanks to Mr. Prince and his colleagues for their service. Would the gentleman yield some of his time to me? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, the, the point I want to ask you, Mr. Prince, is we appreciate what you've done, but it looks like a lot of people in the U.S. military don't appreciate it. Uh, one man, Army Colonel Teddy Spain, said, I personally was concerned about uh, any of the civilians running around on the battlefield during my time there. My main concern is with their lack of accountability when things went wrong. Another uh, senior U.S. military official said, uh, we had guys who saw the aftermath, meaning aftermath of your activities there. It was very bad. This is going to hurt us badly. And then uh, we had um, uh, Secretary of Defense Robert Gates. These incidents may be uncommon. We don't know how common they are, but let's assume that they are uncommon. I believe that they still have disproportionate impact on the Iraqi people. Uh, we have people who are conducting themselves in a way that makes them an asset in this war, not a liability. You're not answerable to the U.S. military, are you? You report to the State Department. You're under contract to state, isn't that In right? Iraq, we report, we report to the State Department. But if I could just so add. So your people aren't under the same rules as the U.S. military? Uh, we operate under defensive rules well, of will engagement. The yield? Will, will the gentleman yield? Uh, actually, Mr. Chairman, if I, if I could reclaim my time um, in responding. Uh, uh, Ms. Prince, you've provided the committee a, a, a detailed list of, of the regulations, um, treaties, laws that you operate under. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So, and, and that includes um, items that relate to both Department of State and Department of Defense? It includes laws like MEJA, 
the UCMJ, all of which we can be held accountable, our people can be held accountable for uh, while operating overseas. And, and let me just ask, answer Mr. Chairman about uh, whether we're adding value to the military or not. I have to say my proudest professional moment was about a year and a half ago, I spoke at the National War College. Um, and after my speech, a colonel, full bird colonel came up to me afterwards and he said, uh, you know, I just came back from Brigade Command in Baghdad. I had uh, four or 5,000 guys working for him. He said, as his guys were driving around the city, on the tops of their dashboards of their Humvees were the Blackwater call signs of the frequencies because his soldiers knew that if they got in trouble, the Blackwater guys would come for them. They would come to their aid and assist them, medevac them, and help them out of a tough, of a tough spot. Well, Brigadier so if that's, General, if that's the reputation we have. Coming, well, Brigadier I, General Carl Horst said, these guys run Chairman, loose in this country and do stupid stuff. There's not authority over them, so you can't Mr. come Chairman. down on them when they escalate force. They shoot people and someone else has to deal with the aftermath. It happens all over the place. Security contractors in Iraq under scrutiny after shootings. What do you say? Uh, sir, I can also tell you there's 170 some security companies operating through Iraq. We get painted with a very broad brush of a lot of the stuff they do. Uh, on an almost weekly basis, we get a contact from someone in, in DOD, some talk somewhere that says, oh, three Blackwater guys were just taken hostage here. Four guys were killed there. Oh, you're involved in a shooting over here. When we fully investigate, we didn't, have a, we didn't have any teams of guys within 100 miles of that location. But if a private security contractor did it, it often gets attributed to us. Yeah, well, regardless of what private security contractor does it, it's a problem for the United States. Mr. Platt, you were kind enough to yield me time. I'll, I'll be, uh, without objection, I'd like to give you another 30 seconds. If you could, and I was going to yield to the ranking member. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate your questions. But let me just say, Mr. Chairman, for the sake of argument, you're right. If we're paying too much and getting too little, what's the answer? More troops in Iraq? Less safe troops, less safe diplomats, or less safe members. I mean, this is the trade-off. This is what we're trying to explore here. They're contractors. At the end of the day, we have to look to the government who is contracting this out, putting down the rules of engagement, and they'll be on our next panel. He's just performing his contract at this point, and I think we have questions that we can ask the State Department. Uh, but the alternatives, uh, none of them are attractive when you're in a war zone. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Tierney. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, may I have one minute, please? We do not need to leave. One minute, please? Yeah, uh, uh, Thank you. Yes, go ahead. I'd like to ask that Mr. Davis and I, during this moment, have a minute each, because I would like to say something that doesn't involve a question and you might want to respond to it. Um, the point I want to make, it, you raise that very essential question, what do we do if we don't have enough troops there? Well, I think we have to look at the fact that this isn't a short-term war. We've been there five years. It looks like we may be there another 10 years. And even General Shinseki said we needed more troops. Well, at some point, you have to make a decision in this battlefield, in this war. If we don't have enough troops to do the job, then we should get more troops. But if we're going to go on, on the cheap to get private contractors, we're not on the cheap at all. It's costing us more money, and I believe it's costing us problems, causing us problems with the Iraqi people. Let's, uh, let's let the military replan this. It seems to me we've had bad decisions from this administration, uh, too much of the time in handling this whole war, planning for it adequately, and staffing it adequately with the U.S. military. They're the ones that ought to be doing this job. Mr. Davis? Well, Mr. Chairman, I understand. But, but let me just say, troops are there, uh, are not paid to protect civilians. That's not what military troops are trained for. I went through uh, officer basic course at Fort, uh, in, in Georgia at Fort Benning. I went through basic training at Fort Ord. That's not what troops are trained for when they go out into the uh, battle zone. This is a unique responsibility. Uh, it is through the State Department, not the Department of Defense. And as we'll hear from the next panel, our troops uh, are not at this point been trained to do this kind of work. Uh, this is a, a different kind of a province. Now, if we want to tra train them to do that, we can do that. But that hasn't been the history throughout the last 50 years of the military that I'm aware of. So we then have to decide from a cost-benefit perspective. I think this is an important conversation to have. 
But to date, that is not the contractor's fault. I think our argument would be with the State Department. I want to yield to Mr. Tierney, but Blackwater and the private military recruit from our military. So these people are trained to do the job that Blackwater and other private military people are asking them to do. So uh, why can't the military do it? I think they could do it if we had enough military personnel. Sure, I would like Mr. Prince to respond, but I am sure they retrain them. They don't just take raw recruits out. Could I just ask him to respond? Uh, yes, sir. There was a, uh, an earlier allegation about companies like us um, raiding the ranks of the special operations community for this kind of work. And uh, the GAO report found that, yes, they, um, they are getting out and working for companies like us, but they are not getting out at any higher rate than they ever did before. So they're, instead of becoming a financial analyst or an accountant or a, uh, some other kind of businessman, they come to work for companies like Blackwater, but they are not getting out at any, uh, any rate higher than they ever did before. And if I could just correct two, uh, two slight errors I made. We did not have any, uh, any fatalities of Blackwater personnel in 2006. And um, one of the contracts I testi testified to as being under the GSA schedule was in fact sole source. We will get you the, uh, the very detailed information as to which contracts were GSA and which were sole source. I am not qualified to answer that right now. Will we will receive any documents you Mr. Chairman, have. I just have a minute. I mean, I mean, but I think that is one of the things we want to get to in this and later hearings is if the mission is going to be four or five or six years, do you want to change the mission of the military? But that is not the contractor's fault. Our argument there is with the Defense Department and the State Department. I, I, I strongly encourage the Congress to sponsor true activity based cost studies. What does it cost the Air Force to move a pound of cargo in a war zone? What does it cost to put a brigade in the field or to train it and to equip it? All these basic functions. Even what is the hourly cost you, of, uh, of aircraft uh, doing refueling? We are going to have you answer some more questions, I am sure, along those lines. Mr. Tierney, it is your turn to question. Are you certain, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> thank you. Mr. Prince, thank you for being here today uh, on that. Uh, we have been discussing a little bit here uh, about the, the goal of this particular venture here, and, and I think that General Petraeus has been pretty clear that he would like to change it from the type of war it has been to one where he wants to defeat insurgents. Once, and that entails, in significant part, winning the hearts and minds. So I want to read you this quote. Counterinsurgents that use excessive force to limit short-term risk alienate the local, local populace. They deprive themselves of the support or tolerance of the people. This situation is what insurgents want. It increases the threat they pose. Do you know who made that statement? Do I know who made that statement? Yes. No, sir. That was General Petraeus. You know, he's the one that wrote the official counterinsurgency manual. It does appear from some of the evidence here, though, that Blackwater and other companies sometimes at least conduct their missions in ways that lead exactly in the opposite direction that General Petraeus wants to go. Uh, but that doesn't mean you are not fulfilling your contractual obligations. In a recent report, there was a quote on Ann Exline Starr, who was a former Coalition Provisional Authority Advisor. It talks about the fact that the private mission is different from the overall public operation. Those, for example, doing escort duty are going to be judged by their bosses solely on whether they get their client from point A to point B, not whether they win Iraqi hearts and minds along the way. And she goes on to talk about uh, the fact that soldiers, when they escorted her, because they are able to escort people and train for that, uh, oftentimes also interacted with the Iraqi community uh, and did things that ingratiate themselves to the Iraqis. The contractors, by contrast, focused only on the contract. She said what they told her was, our mission is to protect the principle at all costs. If that means pissing off the Iraqis, too bad. Her language, not mine. Uh, another counterinsurgency expert is Army Colonel Peter Mansour. Earlier this year, he made a statement about private military contractors, and he said, if they push traffic off the roads or if they shoot up a car that looks suspicious, they may be operating within the contract, but it is to the detriment of the mission, which is to bring the people over to our side. So when we look at Blackwater's own records that show that you regularly move traffic off the roads and you shoot up cars in over 160 incidents on firing of suspicious cars, we can see, I think, why the tactics you use in carrying out your contract might mitigate against what we're trying to do in the insurgency. Retired Army officer, and actually is a conservative analyst now, Peter, Ralph Peters, he was more blunt about it. He said, armed contractors do harm coin counterinsurgency efforts. Just ask the troops in Iraq. We have had complaints from military leaders over and over again that the way that some contractors operate in Iraq uh, are causing danger and anger against the United States forces. Let me give you one example. For most of 2005, the Army's 3rd Infantry Division was in charge of security in Baghdad. Here is what the Deputy Commander of this division, Brigadier General Carl Horst, said about Blackwater and other private military contractors. These guys run loose in this country and do stupid stuff. There is no authority over them, so you can't come down on them when they escalate force. 
They shoot people and someone else has to deal with the aftermath. It happens all over the place. Are you familiar with General Horst, sir? No, sir. I've never met him. Okay. Well, here's what uh, Colonel Hamas said when he was an officer in Iraq. He said, the problem is in protecting the principal, they had to be very aggressive. And each time they went out, they had to offend locals, forcing them to, side, to the side of the road, being overpowering and intimidating, at times running vehicles off the road, making enemies each time they went out. So they were actually getting our contract exactly as we asked them to, at the same time hurting our counterinsurgency effort. And this goes on again back to Colonel Peter Manso, who said, I would much rather see basically all armed entities in a counterinsurgency operation fall under the military chain of command. And the CENTCOM commander, Admiral James Fallon, who we all know now for his current work, his quote is, my instinct is that it's easier and better if they were in uniform and working for me. Can you see and appreciate, Mr. Prince, why there might be some contradiction between what we're asking your organization and others like it to do under the contract uh, as opposed to what we're trying to do as a military force on counterinsurgency? Sir, I understand the challenges that uh, the military faces there. Um, like I said before, there's 170 some companies doing business in Iraq. Most of those security contractors are DOD. Uh, I think that DOD officers would even complain about their lack of reach over their own DOD, Corps of Engineers, Minsticky type contractors. Second, um, we know we're part of the, uh, the total force in trying to get the mission accomplished. Uh, you know, of the 16,000 missions our guys have done, um, only 195 resulted in any kind of discharge of a weapon. That's less than 1%. So we strive for perfection, but we don't get to choose when the bad guys attack us. Uh, you know, the bad guys have figured out, the terrorists have figured out how to make a precision weapon with a, a car loaded with explosives with a suicidal driver. But uh, just to but, interrupt you for a second, you're not asserting that every time that you take a, a, a affirmative action, it was somebody firing at you first. You do acknowledge that on some occasions, at least, it was a preventive act or, uh, on your part of your people? Yes, sir. But this is what happens when our guys are not able to prevent a suicide car bomb. This happened, this blew up three Blackwater personnel and one State Department security officer up in Mosul. It tossed a 9,000-pound armored Suburban 50 feet into the side of a building, followed by a whole bunch of small arms fire from the rooftops. Right. A very serious ambush killed four Americans that fast. My question was that you're not disputing the fact that on some occasions when your people might be afraid that something like that is going to happen, that they may fire first, ask questions later. Sir, the, um, like I said, the, the bad guys have made a precision program. weapon. The Air Force has a system called a DIRCOM, Directional Infrared Countermeasures. It's used to break the lock of an incoming surface-to-air missile. Shines a laser in the seeker head, the missile breaks lock and it veers away. We have to go through a use of force continuum to try to break the lock of this potential deadly suicide weapon. Hand and arm signals, sirens, signs at the back of the vehicles, water bottles, uh, pen flares, shots to the radiator, shots to the windshield before we even go to a lethal force option. So our guys do go through it. Well, but they get somebody it right else has Gentleman's time has different. expired. Mr. Waxman, I'd like to just finish up my thought, uh, if I might. I think there's been fairly good uh, if you could consideration do it in on the part of the committee here. Seconds rather than minutes. Thank you. Uh, the point being made is that there are instances that I've, you're not denying uh, that where people shoot first on that. And when you multiply that by the number of times it happens, the number of people in Iraqis that are implicated in those situations, the number of people that they tell, it goes against our counterinsurgency effort and it goes to the issue of whether or not uh, we ought to have military personnel doing the job, whether this is an inherently government function that we ought to have done on the public side of it as opposed to having contractors who, are, by what we're seeing here today, really don't have much accountability to be exercised over them by either the State Department or the Department of Defense. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Gentleman yields back the rest of his time, and the Chair now recognizes Mr. Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, excuse, excuse me, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Prince, did you want to respond to what was just said? That wasn't a question. That was a statement, and the member is in his Well, I know, but when an uh, allegation... Mr. Duncan is recognized. Mr. Chairman, when an allegation Mr. is Mr. Duncan made is recognized. You're using his That's time. A, I'll, I'll get him back, Mr. Burton. That's right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, Washington Post reported yesterday, it said Army General David H. Petraeus, the top U.S. commander in Baghdad, overseeing more than 160,000 troops makes roughly 180000 a year, or some $493 a day. That comes out to less than half the fee charged by Blackwater for its senior manager of a 34-man security team. Our committee memorandum says using Blackwater instead of U.S. troops to protect embassy officials is expensive. 
trying to do. Trying That's to do putting it lightly. Blackwater charges the government $1,222 per day for the services of a private military contractor. This is equivalent to $445,000 per year, over six times more than the cost of an equivalent U.S. soldier. Uh, this war has produced some of the most lavish, most fiscally excessive, most uh, exorbitantly profitable contracts uh, in the history of the world. And it seems to me that uh, fiscal conservatives should be under no, should feel no obligation to defend this type of, uh, uh, of contracting. In fact, it seems to me that fiscal conservatives should be the ones most horrified by this. And I notice in the table that uh, Blackwater's contracting has gone from 25 million in 2003, 48 million in 2004, to 593 million in 2006. If we are going to be there another 10 years, as some have said, I surely hope that we're not going to continue to see these types of ridiculously excessive uh, increases in the contracts that are being handed out. Uh, I also notice that Blackwater is a subsidiary of the Prince Group uh, of Prince Group Holdings, and that another one of the holdings of that firm is Presidential Airways, an aviation company that has held a contract with the U.S. Air Force Air Mobility Command. Mr. Prince, can you tell me uh, what percentage of Prince Group Holdings it, it comes from federal contracts of all or any types? Uh, could you say the question again? Sorry, I didn't quite hear you. Can you tell me? Uh, I don't know what all companies are in. The, uh, I, I don't know all the companies that are in your Prince Group Holdings. Apparently, there is a Presidential Airways. I don't know how many other companies there are. What I'm wondering about is how much of Prince Group Holdings comes from federal contracts of any and all types. Uh, most of the Prince Group holdings come from federal contracts. But if I could just come back and answer uh, uh, your statement about um, prices that we charge, that $1,222. When, when, when you say most, does, it, does that mean 100 percent? No. Um, rough guess what percentage? Rough guess, 90 percent. 90 percent. Do you still have a contract with Presidential Airways with the Air Force Mobility Command? Yes, sir. And rough, rough guess how much is that contract each year? I don't know what the exact number is, sir. It's for uh, eight aircraft right now. I don't know what they price out at. What other companies are in Prince Group Holdings? Um, there's a long list. Uh, I've got a manufacturing business that has nothing to do with, uh, with, with federal stuff, and we make pieces and parts for um, uh, automotive, appliance, industrial power. Uh, we compete against the, the likes of the Japanese and Koreans and, uh, and European companies every day. All right. But That's if I fair. could just answer the, uh, the, the, the question about how much we charge, those are competitively bid prices. Uh, the 1222 cited in the report is not accurate. Uh, you also, the committee should have received uh, this. I don't know if you've seen that. Uh, it lays out um, uh, base year bill rates for uh, for an average security guy. Base year is 981, not 1222. Uh, and our profit on that projected to be 10.4 percent, nothing higher. And on top of that, I can tell you uh, we have three helicopters that have been shot down this year. Little Bird, two Bell 412s. Those are company helicopters, and when, go, and, when, and when they go down, that comes out of our hide. We have to self-insure on those. So the risks we take, the financial risks, whenever an, uh, an aircraft is doing a mission for the State Department or responding to some uh, medevac need above and beyond the statement of our contract, trying to pull a U.S. soldier uh, out of a, a bad, wounded situation, we take that risk uh, as a company and our guys do themselves at great personal peril. So right, it, is, it is not just about the money. It, we're a business. We try to be efficient and excellent and deliver a, a, a good service. We're happy to have that argument, sir, about, uh, not the argument, the discussion. Sponsor an activity-based cost study. What would it cost the diplomatic security service to bring all those folks in-house as staff? Look at it. We're happy to have that argument. If, if, if government doesn't want us to do this, we'll go do something else. But uh, 
there's a, plenty of case to be made and plenty of um, spreadsheets to be analyzed. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Prince, uh, I am truly disturbed by reports of Blackwater contractors uh, wreaking havoc on innocent Iraqi citizens. I'm, I'm equally troubled that taxpayers have been taken for a ride by paying six times the cost of, of a U.S. soldier for Blackwater contractors. Uh, now, Mr. Prince, you have argued that Blackwater provides a cost-effective service to the U.S. government in part because by hiring private contractors, the government can avoid paying carrying costs such as training salaries and benefits. Yet in your written testimony, you state that Blackwater personnel are all military veterans and law enforcement veterans, uh, many of whom have recent military deployments. Uh, since so many of your employees have recently left government service, uh, doesn't that mean they have received uh, years of specialized training at the expense of the federal government? People serve the U.S. government for different periods of time, and that's a, that's a choice they make and have been making since the U.S. has had a, a standing military. They serve for four years, they serve for six, they serve for 20 or 30. So the U.S. taxpayers have paid for that drink. They're paying for that anyway. We provide a vehicle, a mechanism for the U.S. government to utilize uh, that sunk cost that they put into the training for these people. We reorganize it and package it in a way to fill these gaps that the U.S. government has in these kind of contingency operations to stand up a, a thousand man, or actually you need a 3,000 man, uh, at least, military police brigade to do this kind of work because for every person that's deployed, they're going to have two more back stateside, one in training and one in stand down. So you, you spend that meter and the costs get big very quickly. You know, last so we're just reorganizing those skills that the government has already paid for. Yeah, and last it back to work. week, uh, Defense Secretary Robert Gates expressed concern that Blackwater and other private military contractors are actually poaching the military's ranks, luring service members away with much, with, uh, much higher salary. When Secretary Gates testified before the Senate Appropriations Committee, he said he has asked Pentagon officials to work on drafting non-compete clauses in order to put some limits on the ability of these contractors to lure highly trained soldiers out of our forces to go and work for them. How do you feel about non-compete clauses, Mr. Prince? I think they would be fine, but the fact is everyone that joins the military doesn't necessarily serve 20 years. So at some point they're going to uh, get out after four, six, eight, whatever that period of time is, whatever they decide, because we don't have a draft, we have a voluntary service. Um, I think it would uh, it'd be upsetting to a lot of soldiers if they didn't have the ability to go use the skills that they've accumulated in the military to go work in the private sector, because you could make the same case about uh, aviation mechanics, jet engine mechanics, um, guys that work on a reactor on a submarine. All those skills have direct correlation to the private sector. I don't think putting um, non-competes in for them uh, would do well to, to draw guys in the military in the front side either. Well, but I, again, the GAO study found that, that the special operations community, yes, folks are getting out uh, and they go to MBA school, they become some, some other private sector job. Yes, a lot of them come to work for companies like us, but not at any higher rate than they ever did before. Well, I mean, if the, if the Pentagon adopts the non-compete clause, I mean, it, it, it certainly indicates to me that the secretary uh, is, is really concerned about you all poaching on our service personnel, and, and, and that's what it indicates to me. Uh, let me also say that um, uh, to the viewers of C-SPAN today, uh, this, this Congress and those in this, some in this Congress and the administration uh, seem to be steeped in hip, hip, hypocrisy as far as uh, uh, taking these frequent flyer, frequent flies to uh, the green zone in Baghdad. Uh, when you look at, they are some of the same ones who would never lift a rifle to defend this country in Vietnam 
but yet ridicule and criticize those who have not traveled to Baghdad. Just want the, the American public to be aware that some in here are steeped in hypocrisy. And I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman's time is concluded. Uh, gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I come from Ohio, and Ohio is known frequently as the heartland. <clears throat> and in the heartland, there are a few things that are easy that are not so easy in Washington, D.C. Even in Hollywood, some of these things are easy. And those are the issues of who's on our team and who's on their team. And today I'm a little saddened by this hearing because I am absolutely a supporter of congressional oversight and believe that this committee has incredible functions that we have to do. Our witness today even talked about being a contractor, the questions that we should be asking of reliability, accountability, cost. Many of, a lot of the information we have before us is about dollars, rules of engagement, and the like. But what unfortunately dissolves into our team versus their team, by any account, by Hollywood's account, by the performance account, Blackwater is our team. Uh, they are our team working in the trenches and in a war zone. I haven't heard many questions in this committee about the rules of engagement or the limits on the work of Al Qaeda or the insurgents. In fact, I don't recall one hearing in this committee where there has been indignation or troubling responses as a result of the, the senseless and heartless killings of Al Qaeda and the insurgents. But I hear today huge concerns over what we must exert as oversight on Blackwater. And I think it crosses the line between our team and their team. Blackwater has questions to answer. And I believe that, uh, that they are prepared to do that and today have come forward to do those things. But we should not go to the extent of undermining Blackwater's ability to perform as our team. The Washington Post today in its editorial, in reviewing how this issue has come to light, stated, Congressional Democrats despise the firm because it symbolizes the private contracting of military missions that many oppose in principle. This is the Washington Post saying that the Congressional Democrats are despising this firm because of its engagement and military missions that they oppose. The Washington Post goes on to say, at the same time, it is foolish. That's a pretty strong word for the Washington Post. At the same time, it is foolish to propose the elimination of private security firms in Iraq and Afghanistan, at least in the short term. I would hope as we continue our important functions of oversight that we don't undermine our team. Now, Mr. Chairman, you made a comment that I, I've got to respond to in your opening statement. It's written in your opening statement, and um, it says, as a general rule, children from wealthy and politically connected families no longer serve in the military. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that, that's an attack on our team. I can tell you that Duncan Hunter's chairman, former chairman of the Armed Services Committee, currently ranking member whose son served um, in Iraq, would, would, um, would disagree with you. Joe Wilson, member of the Armed Services Committee, whose son served um, would disagree with you. And I can tell you that the, um, the DOD in its report on social representation in the U.S. military services and the GAO in their September 22, 2005 report would disagree with you. Uh, quoting from the DOD report, it says, our population representation report shows both the diversity and quality of the total force, men and women of various race, racial and ethnic groups of divergent backgrounds from every state in our country serve as active and selective reserve enlisted members and officers of the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and Air Force and Coast Guard. On particular note, the mean cognitive ability and educational levels of these soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, and Coast Guardsmen are above the average of comparatively aged U.S. citizens. The GAO in their report similarly confirms that between 1974 and 2000, the force became older and better educated. Um, so I would hope that the comments are, uh, by the chairman are not interpreted as, um, as, as what I uh, heard them as, as um, diminishing the abilities or the backgrounds of those who, who serve in our military. Mr. Prince, um, my question for you, um, you are free of some of the limiting acquisition rules that our military is, is subject to. Uh, a general has a different ability to be able to acquire something as, as you do corporately. 
Could you give us some insight as to how our acquisition rules inhibit our military in performing some of the things that you do and ways in which we can change those acquisition rules uh, to deliver to them uh, the things that they need? Uh, thanks for that question. Uh, I would say um, we find that the requirements process for the military constantly looks for the 120 percent solution. Um, and it overspecs the electronic capability. I mean, there's, there's um, an enormous amount of uh, extra stuff and capability put on a vehicle that might not be necessary to just fulfill that job. I mean, if you're going to, you could almost buy vehicles just station, just planned on for Iraq right now, almost off the shelf, without having to plan about uh, net centric warfare and all the other uh, bells and whistles that sometimes the DOD wants to put on things. So we buy to solve the, uh, the situation at hand. Gentleman's time has expired, and I want to apologize to the gentleman for indicating that he's from uh, a different state than Ohio. He's a proud uh, Ohioan, and uh, I certainly wouldn't agree. I want to agree with him. I hope nobody misinterprets my comments. I'd like to now call on uh, Ms. Watson. Then I want an apology for the reference to Hollywood. That's the area that I represent here. Uh, I, I heard the chair apologize. I just had to tail in on that one. But uh, I want to commend Mr. Prince for his duties, for his skill, and for his heading up Blackwater. However, when I hear that one of the patron saints of some people, uh, Rush Limbo, called our soldiers who have been critical of the experience in Iraq, phony soldiers, I am offended. And you should be offended too. And there was a sign over there earlier, Mr. Chair, uh, the General Petraeus satire, and I had sent a message that it should be taken down because it was insulting to people. And I think that people that call our soldiers, who speak from experience, phony, ought to be made to apologize. Would the gentlelady from Hollywood yield for a no, question? No, I will not yield because I have just a little time. Uh, let me say this. I am really concerned when it comes to privatizing the various struggles that we are having in a war zone. And I'm looking at a book here that says, Blackwater, the rise of the world's most powerful mercenary army. That is really disturbing to me because I feel that every young man and woman or every man and woman in the military ought to be paid for their service. And I think you're making a good argument for the amount of money that you have been paid, your organization. And I think my question is, do you feel that we ought to continue on with privatizing the kinds of duties that our military should be trained to execute? Ma'am, the United States military is the finest, most powerful military in the Absolutely. world. Absolutely. Bar none. And they should be paid accordingly. It's designed for large scale conventional operations. What they did to Saddam in 91 and well, then, then again in 2003. Well then there's something wrong with the design. And that's my point. Oh. I think you responded. And uh, I hear you clearly. You are providing a service. And I commend you. Let me just continue on. Uh, you are providing a service. And those little uh, voids, Mr. Chairman and committee members, ought to be filled by the young, the people who volunteer. We have no draft. These are volunteers. And why should they put their lives on the line for this country and not be compensated so their families back at home don't have to go on welfare and are living uh, in housing that is substandard. And I am just infuriated, not with you, 
but with the fact that our State Department and our Department of Defense cannot see their way. And they talk about we don't have the money, saving money. This war is costing us a trillion dollars. You have been paid over a billion dollars and will continue to be paid so that you can buy the helicopters that are shot down. And so my question to you, are we going to have to continue to privatize because we are not training to do what you do? And would it not be better to hire you to train our military to do the kind of guarding or a VIP personnel? Whenever there's a Codell, you have to guard them. When people from the State Department comes, you have to guard them because we say that our military is not prepared and not trained to do that. Oh, well, ma'am, I'm happy to say that we do a significant amount of training for the U.S. military uh, every day at our uh, uh, couple of facilities we have around the country. But you're saying that you feel in a specialty area. It's and a specialty my gap, question a high -end that I throw security. out to all of us is why can't we train these people who are willing, who have courage to go in to the military, but then we have to bring on a private firm to do the job they should be trained to do and pay them three or four times more than we pay those who choose to serve their country by fighting in theater. The military could do that, but the U.S. military can't be all things to all people all the time. We Why not? Gentlelady's time has expired. The tyranny of shortage of time and, 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 and distance. I mean, you can't have a, uh, an anti-air missile guy also be doing PSD missions and knowing how to be an aviation mechanic. They, they're, it's too broad of a base of, uh, of skill requirement. Mr. We Issa? need more people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I have one minute? Thank you, sir. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Eisen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, boy, there's so many inaccuracies, so little time. Uh, perhaps let's start with uh, something from the gentlelady from Hollywood. Uh, isn't it true that, in fact, the military's mission has historically not been to guard either VIPs or the State Department as a whole? Correct. Yes, sir. Isn't it true that, in fact, uh, your organization works under the regional security officer for Baghdad. Yes, sir. And isn't it true that contractors have been used directly and indirectly, uh, in other words, non-federal employees in places like Beirut, Afghanistan, Bosnia, uh, under the Clinton administration, routinely? Isn't there a historic time in which we use non-career RSO uh, you know, uh, foreign service officers for these jobs? Since the founding of the Republic. Okay, so we're not talking about the military here at all, uh, including, with all due respect to Secretary Gates, uh, somebody, if, if the State Department recruited for the positions you're presently providing, they would be, in all likelihood, repeat, re recruiting either current or prior military, wouldn't they? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, and is it reasonable for the State Department to own attack helicopters? Oh. Or Bell helicopters that are weaponized? Um, well, let's that's change up, it another That's up to way. them, and we, our helicopters else, aren't weaponized. Yeah, let, so. Let's look at another way. Outside of the two theaters, Afghanistan and Iraq, do you know of any place in which the State Department owns 
uh, or directly controls uh, weapons, weapon gunships, if you will, to protect convoys? Uh, they do some crop eradication, some co cocaine eradication work in Colombia. That's the only place I know of. Okay. So this is an unusual mission and one that, that begs for not creating a career uh, position for, uh, you know, foreign service officer, helicopter pilot. It would only be about two or three places they'd ever be. Isn't that true? Well, actually, those are all flown by contractors as well, sir. I, I, I Down agree. in Columbia. Yeah, I'm, I'm very well aware of that. And, and that's the point, I guess, is that uh, we're having a hearing that is supposed to not be about your company and supposed to not be about one incident on September 16th. It's supposed to be about cost effectiveness of, uh, of contractors, isn't it? Yes, sir. Uh, and, and I wish we were bringing in facts and figures about, let's say, $600 billion of DOD contracts or DOD cost into one million soldiers so that we could kind of go, well, isn't that about 600000 for every soldier? Isn't, in fact, the cost of the Department of Defense, the military, far greater than what we pay our men and women in uniform at the time that they're in combat? I don't know what those numbers are, sir, but that would be a great fully burdened cost study that Congress could sponsor. They don't have to do the whole thing. Just take some, some key nodes and really study it. Well, and hopefully we will. Hopefully we will get to serious uh, discussion on these issues because I think that looking at the cost benefit should always be done. And uh, I don't want to, uh, for permanent requirements, I don't want to use contractors if, in fact, federal employees would be more appropriate. Uh, I, I will mention one thing is if you're feeling a little pressure today, if it's a little tough, just be glad you don't make a diabetes drug. We have to where, sir? Be glad you don't make a diabetes drug. Compared to what we did to the Avandia makers, GlaxoSmithKline, uh, you're getting off easy, trust me. Uh, they had their product destroyed uh, by uh, jury-rigged uh, testimony and, and studies that were essentially co-opted in advance. But let's, uh, let's just go to one area that I think hasn't been discussed and others might not discuss it. Um, is your sister's name uh, Betsy DuVos? DeVos. Yes. Is that your sister? Yes, it is. And is she, was she a uh, former Michigan Republican Party uh, chairwoman? Yes, she was. And was she a pioneer for Bush? I don't know. Could okay. be. Okay. Was she a large contributor uh, to President they, Bush? They probably were. And raised a lot of money for President Bush? Could went, easily be. Went yep. to the Republican conventions in 2000, 2004. I would imagine they did, yes. Isn't it true that your family... Uh, at least that part of the family, are very well-known Republicans? Yes. Wouldn't it be fair to say that your company is easily identified as a Republican-leaning company and, in fact, uh, the Amway company somewhat so because of uh, uh, family members there? It, just to, you, you don't have to speculate overly, but isn't, isn't that generally something you understand? Blackwater is not a partisan company. Uh, we haven't done any, um, uh, you know, we, we execute the mission given us, whether it's uh, training Navy sailors or protecting uh, State Department personnel. Um, yes, I've given uh, individual political contributions. I've done that since uh, uh, college, and I did it when I was an active duty member of the Armed Services. And I'll probably continue doing that forward. I don't give that. I didn't give up that right when I became a defense right. contractor. And Mr. Chairman, just to, just to finish the thought, like we did on the other side of the aisle, uh, I think you're exactly right that, in fact, while being identified uh, as partisan Republican, in fact, your company appears to have done what all companies do, uh, which is, in fact, to operate to do the job they're doing in a nonpartisan way. And I would hope that this committee and the public takes note that labeling some company as Republican-oriented because of family members is inappropriate, and I would hope that we not do it again, and I yield back. Well, the only one that's done it is you. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, think it's, I think it's been made, I, I think the Maybe report made it Maybe that's why all the Republicans clear. are defending the company. Well, the, the, uh, Mr. Yarmouth, it's your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Prince, welcome. Thank you for your testimony. Thanks, sir. Um, I want to focus on the, um, the whole issue of cost and um, profitability. And I want to clarify something. You talked at one point about the fact that what you are essentially doing is bidding for people who would otherwise be able to make as much money uh, as you would be paying them in the private sector. And uh, first of all, 
some of that defies imagination because we're talking about essentially four to five hundred thousand dollars worth of cost per individual per year to the government, which would put that individual or that job category in the in the highest one percent of income earners in the country. Uh, so my question to you would be, and this is not in any way to impugn or to uh, minimize the value of Navy SEALs, but outside of a military setting, where could a Navy SEAL for those talents make four to five hundred thousand dollars if it weren't for a government contract? I don't know of any of our people that have made four to five hundred thousand dollars working as a contractor. They're not getting they're not getting paid that much. They no, get paid for every day they're in the hot zone. So it's very much like a, a professional mariner's uh, existence. They go to sea, they get paid every day they're in the hot zone. The day they leave, their pay goes to zero. Um, average pay, hypothetically, around $500 a day. We don't, we don't pay the $1,000 a day. That's a huge um, mis, uh, misperception. That's a flat out error in the media. So well, if you take, uh, take $15,000 a month and they work for six months, it's $90,000. But that's not the cost of that job to the American taxpayer. Uh, the yes, sir, but they're, but they're not showing the up at the job naked. On. They need uniforms, equipment, body armor, uh, boots, every, everything you wear from head to toe. Right. Um, their training, their travel, their insurance, sometimes their food. I mean, there's, there's very, very sophisticated price models that we bid competitively for hundreds and hundreds of line items. Believe me, our folks right. burn a lot of um, electrons putting those price models together because you really got to know what you're doing on the front end. But again, it is a competitively bid product. Right. Well, I'm, um, I appreciate that. I want to pursue that a second. But I do have in front of me an invoice uh, from Blackwater to the Department of State in which one of the items is uh, invoice quantity, 3,450 units each at a cost of $1,221.62. That's your invoice. So, I'm not sure what that well, invoice is. Could I, I, ask, could I see that, sir? I'd be happy to submit that for the record. Um, we dealt uh, several months ago with a situation in which I don't believe you were a subcontract. Your company was a subcontractor for uh, the State Department or contractor. You were a subcontractor. And then I'm relating, uh, I'm talking about the incident in Fallujah where four of your employees were ambushed and killed, and we had testimony from uh, two of their wives and two of their mothers several months ago. And in the course of that testimony, it was, uh, we were told that they had actually contracted, each of them, at a rate of $600 a day. That's what they were to be paid. By the time it got to the American taxpayer, it was around $1,100 a day. You were the third subcontractor uh, under a contract given to KBR, as I recall, a Halliburton, then a Halliburton subsidiary. And we asked the question, of all of those subcontracts, did anybody add value up the ladder for that additional $500 based on, uh, and we asked, did they provide any, any special equipment, any special services, whatever? And the answer was no. So in that case, that's not your profit, but it appears to us, it appeared to us that by and large, that additional $500 that the American taxpayer paid for that one person uh, was largely profit to three different corporations. Now, do, can you shed any light on that situation? And I, I don't believe, again, that was, I think, a Defense Department contract, and KBR was just delivering supplies to troops, and you were, you were guarding the convoys. That could easily be. I'm not, um, I'm not completely familiar with the contract and the subcontracting arrangement that you're speaking of, but. Uh, uh, I can tell you, with our work with the State Department, we are direct to the State Department, and there's no other um, uh, intermediaries adding cost or, uh, or not adding value. Okay. One other question I want to ask. You, you made the comparison again about that we have to bid for the, these people, but isn't there a, a significant distinction? I understand if we, the military trains a pilot, and then the pilot goes out and is uh, bid for by commercial aircraft and so forth. That's the private sector bidding. But in this situation, the American taxpayers are bidding against themselves because we trained Navy SEALs. Navy SEALs then go into your employee. Then the Navy has to bid, as I understand, in one report, $100,000 to get them back. Uh, but we're bidding against ourselves, aren't we? We're not bidding against an, an, a, another out external competitor. The, the nature of the demand of this, uh, especially it grew for Blackwater, not, um, it grew even before 9-11. It grew after the, the coal was blown up, that Navy ship. So in a um, 
Now, in a post-9-11 world, you have a lot of different demands for those kind of skill sets that are much higher demand than they were in the late 90s. So that is a changing nature of the market. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. McHenry? Mr. Westmoreland. Oh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just to clarify a little bit about who's calling who a Republican company, uh, I want to read from a December 13, 2006 letter from Callahan and Blaine to uh, Ms. Pelosi, Mr. Waxman, Senator Dorgan, Senator Reed, Representative Chris Van Hollen. Nonetheless, as American citizens, we hereby petition to you to initiate support and continue the congressional investigations into war profiteering and specifically Blackwater's conduct. Now that there has been a shift in power in Congress, we are hopeful that your investigation as well as the investigations by Senator Doran and Senator Waxman will be taken seriously by these extremely Republican companies such as Blackwater's who have been uncooperative to date and that these investigations will be fruitful and meaningful. And um, Mr. Prince, you may recognize that name because I believe they also are the attorneys from some people who are suing you. Mr. Prince, <clears throat> first of all, let me give you a little background probably as to why you're here. There is a party uh, in Congress that does not like companies who show a profit. If you're wealthy, they figure you should have paid more taxes or that you're a crooked businessman. They do not understand someone who is an entrepreneur and offers a valuable service that is above its competitions and that is based at a competitive price. They want to fight a war with no casualties. They exploit our children, whether it is with a plan that will socialize medicine in this country or the horrible situation when innocent children are victims of an act of war. They often have hearings such as this to bias lawsuits that their crony lawyer friends may be handling. There is no cost too high for them for citizens to pay, citizens of this country, whether it is the price of personal integrity or more of their wealth as long as it moves forward with the ultimate goal of distribution of wealth uh, of the successful for the takers of this world. They love to have their cake and eat it too, though. For instance, they think the Iraqi government is corrupt and inept, but yet they question you about taking one of your informed employees out of the country with the government's permission. Another example, they say the military should be doing your job, yet they don't want additional troops sent to the theater. One more example, Mr. Prince, is they complain about what our military personnel makes, and then they complain about what you pay the same people that they complained about making so little. So you can see that there is some confusion. I also want to point out to you that nine of the 22 members on this panel that voted, voted uh, that they agreed with moveon.org's attack on General Petraeus. Let me ask you, Mr. Prince, what, well, let me say, some of Blackwater's critics have stated that the firing of personnel has been surprisingly frequent. Have you or your managers ever fired an employee for doing a good job? Uh, not that I know of. And um, I don't think anybody does, do they? So if, some, if one of your employees was doing a bad job or not meeting your criteria, then those are some of the people that you got rid of, right? If they don't hold to the standard, they're, uh, they have one decision to make, window or aisle. And Mr. Prince, what kinds of professional backgrounds do most of your security personnel have? Uh, all of our personnel working on the WPPS type contract come from uh, the U.S. military or law enforcement community. They have um, a number of years of experience uh, doing that kind of work, ranging from uh, five, eight years, up to 20 or 30 years of experience. They're discharged honorably. Most of them are decorated. Um, they've, uh, they've gotten out of the military to choose uh, to take another career path. And so we, uh, we give them the ability to use those skills back again working for the U.S. government. And, and let me just say, we are, uh, we are not a partisan organization. Um, 
that's not uh, on the interview form when you come to work for Blackwater, what party you affiliate with at all. Uh, we affiliate with America. And uh, the idea that people that. call us mercenaries, uh, we have Americans working for America, protecting Americans. And, and I think you do a very good job. And, I and think the Oxford Dictionary you know, d you know, details, uh, uh, defines a mercenary as a professional soldier working for a foreign government. And uh, Americans working for America uh, is not it. Yep, we have a handful of, uh, uh, of, we call them third country national folks, folks from Latin America. They guard some gates and they guard some camps. They don't leave that area. They're static guards. Our PSD guys are Americans working for America. Gentlemen, time sir. has expired. Mr. Braley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Prince, my best friend married Mary Lubbers, whose father and grandfather were the presidents at Hope College. Small so, world. Uh, I want to start by asking you about a question you, or a statement you made on page three of your written statement that you shared with the committee, where you wrote, the company, its personnel are already accountable under and subject to numerous statutes, treaties, and regulations of the United States. And then you went on and attached to your statement a list of existing laws, regulations, and treaties that apply to contractors and their personnel. Is that the document that I'm holding up? Yes, sir. Attached? Is it your testimony today, under oath, that all Blackwater employees working in Iraq and Afghanistan are subject to the Uniform Code of Military Justice, the Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act, and the War Crimes Act. It is my understanding that is the case, yes, sir. All right, well, let's look at this document. I want to ask you about it. This document, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, applies in the time of declared war. You would agree that there has been no declared war in Iraq or Afghanistan? No, but I believe it's been amended to include contingency operations. Is it your understanding that a contingency operation would apply to what's going on in Iraq and Afghanistan? Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but my layman's understanding is yes. All right. And then it says to persons serving with or accompanying an armed force in the field. Do you see that? Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, you're reading from it. Well, I'm just reading from the document that you provided to right. us. If that's what the Uniform Code of Military Justice provides, you would agree that based upon your own description of the activities of your company, there are times when your employees are not serving with or accompanying armed forces in the field. There are times when U.S. military units are actually embedded in our motorcades. But to answer my question, there are times when your employees are not serving with or accompanying armed forces in the field. Isn't that correct? Sir, I'm not a lawyer, well, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to give you that level of detail. If you want a, a, a clear written statement as to the uh, a company opinion, I'm sure the State Department can answer what, what their opinion is, is on that. But uh, we've looked at it, and we feel comfortable that uh, uh, our guys could be brought um, under investigation with, uh, with those ruling legal authorities over their, uh, over their heads. And then let's look at the Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act. Section 3261, criminal offenses committed by certain members of the armed forces and by persons employed by or accompanied by the armed forces outside the United States. You would agree that there are circumstances where your employees would not meet that definition based upon their service in Iraq and Afghanistan. I believe that was changed yet again to include any U.S. funded contract. Well, that's the definition that applies to U.S. funded contracts from the statute. Again, I'm not a lawyer, sir. I'm sorry. Then let's look at the War Crimes Act of 1996, which applies if the perpetrator is a U.S. national or a member of U.S. armed forces. You would agree, based upon your testimony today, that there would be circumstances when some of your employees would not meet the definition of perpetrator to be covered by the War Crimes Act. Again, I'm not sure, sir. Um, well, you testified are, are, that you hire some third country nationals. They would not be U.S. nationals, would they? Yes, correct. And they would not be members of the U.S. Armed Forces. But they're serving in a U.S. DOD contingency operation. Then let's talk about these payments that have been made as a result of deaths that were related to the conduct of Blackwater employees. One of the payments that we've been provided information about was this $15,000 payment to the guard's family who was guarding Iraqi Vice President uh, Mahdi. Are you familiar with that payment? 
Yes, sir. Did you have any input into the determination of the amount of that payment? Uh, I discussed it with some State Department officials, yes. Did you feel that it was a satisfactory level of compensation for the loss of that individual? I believe the cash that was paid was actually 20000 not fifteen. All right, fifteen dollars or $20,000. Based on the information that we've been provided, uh, one of the things we know is that Blackwater charges the government $1,222 a day for the services of its, some of its employees. Is that correct? Uh, I believe that number is lower. Well, the, let's the, the, chart, the chart that we provided the committee shows a, uh, a blended average significantly less than that. Assuming that figure is correct, if you take someone your age in the United States and look at the U.S. life table, you'll find that somebody your age in this country has a life expectancy of 40 years. So if you were to take that rate of $1,222 a day, multiply it times 365 days a year, multiply it by a 40-year life expectancy, you would get a total lifetime earnings payout of $17,841,200. You would agree with me that pales in comparison to a payment of either fifteen dollars or $20,000. Uh, Thomas, time has expired, but you, should, you can answer the question. Uh, your actuary, your, your calculations there don't make any sense to me because uh, the, the, that charge, that $1,200 charge that you're talking about us claiming that we charge the government, uh, that includes aviation support. Some of those helicopters that got shot down that comes out of our, uh, out of our hide. Uh, gear, training, travel, all the rest. So I'm not sh quite sure how that math works out, but um, I'd be happy to get back to you if you have any written questions. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. McHenry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to go through a few facts and make sure we have this on the record. Um, the gentleman is discussing cost, and I want to sort of understand all the facts before we get to a conclusion here. Um, you were uh, previously in the Navy SEALs. How long were you in the military, sir? Uh, 92 through the end of 96. Okay. What is the average time, having been in the, the SEALs, perhaps you would know this, what is, what's the average time a special, uh, special forces operator is in the service? Uh, five, six years up to 20. It, it really varies. But based on your, your experience. You guys really make a decision point at about 12 years whether they're going to stay for a career or right. they get out. So I would okay. say 10 let's, to 12 years. Let's say uh, an operator uh, retires from the military, uh, at, which, at which point a Navy SEAL, average Navy SEAL is doing much more, uh, a much different operation. Uh, they're dealing with explosives rather than defensive uh, uh, caravans and convoys. Uh, what do you do with, that, with those, uh, those, those individuals? Do you take Navy SEALs and put them right in there, right out uh, onto the streets? Is, is there training from Blackwater? The personnel that uh, deploy for us, uh, they go through, obviously we vet the resumes. We do a criminal background check on them. Uh, when they've been accepted, when the resume has been accepted by, uh, by the customer, they come in for training, they go through another 164 hours of training and vetting at Blackwater, um, tactics, techniques, procedures, driving, um, firearms, uh, defensive tactics. Um, they go through a full psychological evaluation, medical, dental exam, uh, physical tests, shooting tests. There is a, uh, a very, very rigorous pre-deployment program they all have to do. a significant amount of expense. Yes. All right. And that's all when, baked when, into that all right. daily J cost. Just for the record, when was Blackwater formed? 1997. At what point did you receive your first government contract? Uh, for the first number of years, uh, it, the, our customers were uh, individual SEAL platoons or a Marine Recon platoon or a, a, an A-team. Um, and it was down to the... Uh, individual team sergeant or warrant officer paying with a credit card. Our first big uh, government contract uh, that we won competitively was the Navy um, um, force protection contract that they, uh, they started off after the coal was blown up. We had a, a billion and a half dollar ship blown what up by two guys that? in a Zodiac. What year was that? Uh, we started that uh, in 2001. Okay. Um, who was your client in Iraq? Department of State. Okay. Um, who are, how many competitors do you have within this contract? Uh, there are two others. Two others. And there was a okay. uh, big competition before then to be down selected for the WPPS contract. And it, how, how is that contract awarded? Uh, it's awarded competitively. You go through an uh, enormous proposal process. 
they come and inspect your facilities, uh, your training standards, the, um, the resumes of each of your uh, personnel. They're, they even have to ex uh, uh, accept and inspect the resumes of the instructors you're going to have, and they come and audit the program on an on a almost weekly basis. Okay. Uh, so let, let's go, uh, go forward. There, there, there's roughly 1,000 uh, Blackwater contractors, operators, uh, these former veterans that, that you, uh, or veterans that you now have trained that are out uh, securing uh, embassy staff and a number of uh, civilians in Iraq. You, let's say it's a thousand, just yes, for purposes here. Roughly how much administrative staff do you have associated with those 1,000 individuals? Uh, we run that whole program, uh, instructors, uh, program management people, that sort of thing with, uh, with less than 50 people. With, with less than 50 people. Yes, sir. So roughly it's 1,000 to 50 is the ratio from operators in the field to administrative staff. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, now there's this notion, we're not the, you know, we're not the uh, uh, Armed Services Committee here, but there's this notion of tooth to tail ratio, which means how many operators do you have in the field and the expense of them, how much uh, administra uh, administrative functions do you have? In the active duty military, uh, based on your recollection, what is that rough estimate? What's the DOD's tooth to tail ratio? Yes. Um, I've seen as high as uh, 8 to 1 or even 12 to 1. Okay. One but tooth, eight to, 8 to 10, 12 tail. So one individual in the field, 12 individuals uh, outside of operating. So the ratio when you talk about, when these, when these people on the committee talk about the expense of having that one operator in the field, it is far less for an individual contractor. When you're a private security contractor like you are in Iraq, it's far more effic efficient for the total program to have a contractor because their tooth to tail ratio is far better than what it is in the active duty military. Therefore, the cost of that one operator in the field for all the support services they have associated with them is far less for uh, a company like Blackwater than it is for the active duty military. And can you, you know, in, in my time is up, but if you can actually uh, discuss this with the committee and maybe in a minute or so explain um, the expense uh, of the overall operations. Uh, all I would say Gentlemen's is I, time's up, but Mr. Prince, I, I would just encourage uh, the committee, uh, and we'd be happy to make some suggestions on areas where you could do a true activity-based cost study. What does it cost the U.S. government to do X, Y, Z functions in the field and do, and do a, an accurate drill down? Because unless you know what something costs, everything uh, before that or after that is her. Is it your contention really? that it's far cheaper time really for you to expired. operate in the field? I, I just wanted to answer this yeah. question, if, if I could, Mr. Chairman. You didn't is answer it your me. contention that it's much cheaper to the taxpayers for your activities as a contractor with the Department of State than it would be for active duty military to do the very same task because of that tooth to tail ratio? Uh, yes, and because the, it's tough for the military to be all things to all people all the time. If they're going to continue to have air defense artillerymen, um, all the other conventional warfare specific uh, qualifications they have to have, it's tough for them to do all things all the time. Uh, if you have Thank some you. kind of document that backs up your statement, we certainly certainly would like to see it and we'd, we'd like to ask you to provide it to our committee. Yes, sir. Thank you. Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. McHenry and I had the opportunity to go to Afghanistan together where, in fact, the military did provide when we went um, out on us on visits, uh, did provide our security. I also had the opportunity of being in Iraq where uh, we had um, a private uh, security detail um, uh, take, uh, take us from point to point. And I just, uh, there's been some discussion about who is uh, more caring about uh, getting on the ground and seeing um, what is uh, going on. And I just wanted uh, people to know for the record here that I've been both places and under both circumstances. I'd like to follow up a little more on what Mr. Braley was talking about. Um, you, you provided this, this chart on uh, contract, uh, contractor uh, accountability. Um, and you've made uh, the statement that the DOD can bring charges. Uh, against your contractors. Can the Department of State bring charges against your contractors? 
Oh, I believe that would be done by the Justice Department. They do the, the, the prosecuting of, uh, of those laws. Under the CPA Order uh, uh, 17, contractors have immunity from the Iraqi legal system. Is that correct? That's my understanding, yes. So if a black uh, water con uh, contractor would uh, commit uh, as what an investigation might determine would be murder on their own time, there, that was the Christmas Eve uh, holiday, I believe, that you were describing, or uh, ho Christmas holiday, uh, do you believe the Iraqi government uh, would not be able to charge that individual with a crime, even on their own time? Uh, that's my understanding, yes. Do you believe that immunity should be repealed if, if uh, something happens when someone's quote unquote off duty and a, an Iraqi is uh, murdered? Uh, I believe uh, U.S. laws sh should be enforced uh, and you can, you can have that justice system back here in America work. So you believe that the immunity under CPA Order uh, 17 should stand? I, I believe so. I'm not sure uh, any foreigner would okay. get a fair trial in Iraq right now. Uh, I think they would at least get a fair trial here in the United States. Um, you, uh, your charts indicate that contractors are accountable under the Uniform uh, Code of Military Justice. Your contractors work for the Department of State. Is the Department of State accountable under the Muni uh, Uniform Code of Military Justice? Uh, I, I will not be presumptuous to answer for the Department of State, ma'am. Well, you, you, you've provided this. You uh, told Mr. Braley that all your employees are uh, under this chart. So then you're saying that... Well, ultimately, it's for the Justice Department to decide which, which avenue of jurisdiction they have. So this is just what you feel that people might be held under accountability with, with your contractors. This is just a feeling you have. You don't know any of that for a fact, do you? Uh, I had legal opinions that I respect put that together and they, uh, they gave their opinions that those were laws that um, uh, State Department contractors, DOD contractors, contractors for the U.S. government could be so held accountable so, under. So whether it's a feeling or an opinion, you cannot state for a fact for a fact that any of your contractors that have a State Department contract can be held accountable under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. That's correct, ma'am, because uh, that's for the Justice Department to decide. I think that's important to, to clear that up. Do you operate in a military capacity or civilian capacity? Civilian capacity. So now you're saying that civilians uh, well, our, be, our men are not serving members of the U.S. military. So you're saying that civilians can be held accountable to the Uniform Code of Military Justice, in your opinion? And I believe that's why they, uh, they uh, extended that not just to uh, wars that were declared, but also to contingency operations as well. To your knowledge, have there been any military courts or civilian uh, courts that have held any of the contractors who have been uh, charged uh, or been uh, accused of a crime in Iraq? Uh, it's my understanding there was a conviction of a uh, contractor that was working for the CIA that was convicted in North Carolina for actions in Afghanistan. General, General Lady's time is Thank uh, you, Mr. expired. Uh, Mr. Jordan. Thank you for answering my questions. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Prince, I too want to thank you for your service to our country and for uh, the good work that your, your company uh, has been doing uh, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Just want to pick up on a couple things that uh, the Congressman from North Carolina had talked about. Just some general questions. I know you've been sitting there for, for three hours. So just a few questions. I'm going to yield some time to the gentleman from California. How many employees does your, does your you, you mentioned before, a little bit earlier, 1,000 in the field, 50 administrative, but does that represent the entire uh, workforce have, at Blackwater? We have uh, about 550 full-time folks in the United States. Um, 1,000, 1,100 or so in Iraq, and then um, hundreds more in uh, little pockets around the world. The next, big, next greatest concentration would obviously be Af Afghanistan. There's about uh, 300, 400 there. So a couple thousand working for you now? More or less, yes, sir. And um, you, you mentioned uh, the extensive training that when you, some of the special operations individuals who then come to work for you after they leave the military service and the training they undergo. I believe you said earlier that 
there was a study done that shows there is no higher um, exit rate or, or quicker exit rate, we will say, uh, because of your company versus what, what typically happens. Is that true? Right. It was a GAO study, and it was not just directed at us. It was directed at um, kind of the, the private security industry. Okay. And, and real quickly, just tell me, how does your, in your, in your testimony, in the opening paragraph, you talk about um, you provide training to Amer America's military and law enforcement communities and, and, and risk their lives to protect America, Americans in harm's way overseas. It, it, what, so are there several types of contracts that your company does? You do training contracts with the government, uh, protective contract, or do you do one contract per year? Tell me how those work. Uh, we, we have a number of different contracts. We never started this operation to be a, uh, a security provider. Started as a training facility. Uh, okay. The SEAL teams, Special Forces, uh, Marine Recon, SWAT teams, those were our customers uh, for the first few years. Uh, the Navy came uh, after the coal was blown up. We trained uh, well over 100,000 sailors since then uh, how to protect their ships. We do, uh, through one of our affiliates, we do aviation support in Afghanistan. We do... Uh, how many, uh, uh, Mr. Prince, how many contracts would you have right now with, with the federal government? Any idea? M more than 50. Okay. okay. Some are very small, some are very big. But, uh, Again, I want to thank you for your service. And, I, and Mr. Chairman, if I could yield to the gentleman from uh, California. I thank the gentleman. And I just wanted to point something out. Mr. Prince, did you see the memorandum dated October 1st that's yesterday that is entitled uh, Additional Information About Blackwater USA? Comes out of Mr. Waxman's office. Uh, it's 15 pages. Yes. I did see that, yes, sir. Okay. Did you note that on page 5, uh, Mr. Waxman and or his staff uh, said the following, Blackwater is owned by Eric Prince. Mr. Prince is a former Navy SEAL who owns the company through a holding company. After that, it begins to talk about the White House, uh, your father, your father-in-law, your, uh, your sister, et cetera, and basically talks about everything I asked you, the Michigan Republican Party, the donations. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, hopefully, hopefully you'll appreciate that it was your staff that created everything that I brought up, and you put it out in writing one day before this hearing. Uh, and my question to you, Mr. Prince, is have you ever seen a bio about your life that starts off, you were a Navy SEAL, and then goes on to everything your sister did on behalf of the Michigan Party and your Republican credentials? Is, is this the first time you've seen a, a bio like this? Uh, I love my sister very much, but uh, it's not often our bios get printed together. Well, and, and, and you know, it's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I'm noticing, you know, that uh, this, for this committee, uh, you know, a donor search uh, done on the 29th of September at uh, OpenSecrets.org was done to find out how much money you gave to who. Did you know that? I did not know that. And do you think that's really germane to today, or do you think that s attempts to paint you as a Republican supporter? Uh, I, I don't think it's germane today. I think uh, we do good work and um, mighty, mighty proud of the folks that we have doing the work. Okay. And I heard a rumor that your company or someone in your company had given to the Green Party. Do you, do you know about that? Uh, could have been. Okay. I just, I just wanted to know that there were people on both the far left and the far right relative to the chairman who, who, who may have benefited by your company. But I, Mr. Chairman, I would ask that page five of your memo uh, be considered as what I called it, an attempt to paint this gentleman and his company through Republican eyes to a Democrat base for political purposes. And I stand by my statement, Mr. Chairman. Yield back to the gentleman from Ohio. Could I just ask uh, one just clarification, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, um, your first contract, Mr. Prince, uh, government contract was in 1997, wasn't it? 98? Yes. Well, no. Our first customer, we started the business in 97. First customer was January of 98. First federal customer, that was under the Clinton administration. That was a SEAL team. That was under the Clinton administration. Yes, Thank sir. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, I'd like to now recognize Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Prince, in the charter or bylaws of your corporation, either the holding company or Blackwater, does it say explicitly that it will only work for the United States of America or its entities? Uh, no, it doesn't. So but if, if I could clarify, anything we do for any foreign government, any training uh, of anything from, from uh, law enforcement training to any kind of uh, aviation training, tactical flying, any of that stuff, all of that is licensed back through the State Department, another part of the State Department. But you're the owner of the company, the CEO. If uh, limitations like this are not in the charter and bylaws, isn't there a risk that 
should something happen to you that different management in order to maximize profits might seek contracts from any number of other foreign countries like if Vladimir Putin offered a lot of money why would you want to turn that down as a business entity uh, because you'd be violating federal law and the whole place could be shut down very very quickly but you're assuming a State Department license would apply uh, you're oh, it does a regular I mean, private company you can no, no 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 sir I'm sorry we have to have a license to train uh, but I'm not talking about training other people's private police. Say you took s some of your former uh, people who were former Navy SEALs, Special Forces, whatever, and they were working for hire. What prevents you and your current company charter or bylaws prevent those hiring out those people to foreign governments? Uh, U.S. federal law does. Which law? Uh, Defense Trade Controls Act. Any, t any training, any security services, any export of any weapons, any equipment you'd use to do that kind of job uh, requires a license. And on top of that, uh, so this, I this idea that we have this um, uh, private army in the wings is just not accurate. Uh, the people we employ are former U.S. military law enforcement people, the people that have sworn the oath to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. They, they bleed red, white, and blue. So the but, idea that they're going to suddenly switch after having served honorably for the U.S. military and go play for the other team, but it's not likely. But these are independent contractors or employees. They're supposed to do what they're told. And is your omission of this key bit of information from the Charter of Bylaws only due to the fact that it would be redundant? If it's assumed, why don't you go ahead and put it in the Charter and Bylaws that these people, this company, will only work for the United States of America and its entities? Why wouldn't that be a nice addition to the charter? Uh, that wouldn't make any sense because we have NATO allies uh, helping in Afghanistan, uh, helping the United States mission there, and there might be opportunities for us to support, to provide them with training uh, or aviation support or logistics or construction or a lot of other things that allies so, need, especially as the U.S. Uh, is trying to build capacity around the world. There's a lot of countries that need help building out their police departments, um, giving them uh, so more counterterrorism capability. 26 and NATO allies, so you could work for any of them? 26 NATO allies, but more and more the U.S. government is doing uh, FID missions, foreign internal defense. Uh, we've done a number of successful programs for them working for the U.S. government where they, they hire us, we go in and we build, build that capacity uh, and train them and provide the equipment, all of which is licensed by the State Department. When we apply for that license, it goes to the State Department and they farm it out to the relevant part of the DOD to, uh, to control and authorize that licensing. What's the curriculum uh, going to be? What tactics? Even down to which individual in which country is going to be trained so they can do a, che a check on them. So that on your, is all controlled by the U.S. government well, already, sir. On your website, it says that you, did, you were contracted to enhance the Azerbaijan Naval Sea Commando's maritime interdiction capability. Is Azerbaijan a member of NATO? No, but that was paid for by the U.S. government. Well, let me ask another question. It was part of their regional engagement policy. I don't make that policy, sir. Wouldn't it be nice to put in your charter and bylaws that you only work for U.S. or U.S. approved entities? Why would that be harmful to your company? Uh, we'd be happy to do that, but it's, it's absolutely redundant because we can't work for someone that's not U.S. approved. Uh, redundancy is a small objection to making sure that you're a loyal U.S. company. Let me ask another question. What if a large company inside the United States of America wanted to hire your company for services, say to break a strike or uh, for other purposes like that? Is that allowed under your charter and bylaws? Uh, that's not something, um, not something we've even explored. But it would be permissible under your current company charter? It's a new line of business, possibly? No. It might be very profitable? It's not something we're looking at, not part of our strategic plan at all, sir. I know, but you're a mortal human being. Your company would allow it according to its current charter and bylaws? Well, I have five boys that I'm raising, so one of them perhaps will take over someday. Why Gentlemen. not put it in the charter and bylaws? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see that my Mr. time Cooper, has expired. Mr. Cooper, your time has, has expired. Um, Mr. Hodes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Prince, thank you for being with us today. Um, Thanks for having me, sir. Glad I could come here and correct some facts. 
there has been um, some discussion um, from the other side of the aisle about whether or not these hearings are partisan. Um, do you agree that it is not a partisan issue to examine whether or not the use of private contractors, including Blackwater, um, is advantageous to American taxpayers? It's certainly the part of the Congress to, uh, uh, to make sure the money is spent well that uh, taxpayers pay. And do you also agree that it is not a partisan issue to inquire whether